All right, hello out there, everybody. Hopefully you're excited and ready to get to this. Uh, today, we're gonna go through the process of building a multiplayer networked game. If you've been interested in building networked multiplayer games and just kind of never really had an idea how to get started, this should be kind of perfect for you. I'm gonna go through the process of taking a single or a simple multiplayer game that's local multiplayer that you can read all the source for and there's really not that much. And we'll go through making it multiplayer using Mirror. So if you've never used Mirror before, don't worry, I'm very new to it as well. It's going to be kind of a learning process for both of us, but we should be pretty streamlined in getting this all set up. Building a multiplayer game is not too complicated. If you've done it a bunch of times and the things are simple, it just gets much more complicated as they get bigger or when you're converting a project later on. So here we're just going to start with a project that's very early on. I'm going to show you the process of just going through that conversion. But if you haven't seen the previous streams, by the way, and you don't know what the code looks like, don't worry, I'm going to run through all of the past code first. We'll talk about it real quick to take like five minutes, go through how the project works, how you run around with two players using PlayStation controllers, and then how we convert that into network multiplayer. Um, before we get started though, if you don't mind just sharing the stream or maybe just hitting the like button or subscribing and sharing, whatever you can do really helps. I appreciate it if you can just go out and like post it on whatever your favorite sharing thing is, that'd be awesome. Um, but I guess, yeah, that's pretty much all I had to say. So I guess, um, what, was there anything else I wanted to ask? Oh yeah, I was really curious. Before we get going, how many of you have already seen the previous streams? Can you just put in like yes or no on whether or not you've seen it? I just kind of want to get an idea of the number of people so I know how deep to go into the, uh, the past code. It's not going to take very long, like I said, but it'll be uh, I just getting some context there and how many people have actually seen this stuff. So let me switch over to desktop mode while everybody answers that and start showing what we're going to be building, what we're building upon, and what we're going to turn into a multiplayer game. You might have seen in the thumbnail, got a laptop uh, sitting right next to me to do multiplayer development on, so we can kind of connect to it over the network once we've got it working locally. So, little shooter game, I got my controller, I can move around a character, I got the red guy as player one, I believe, and I can move and I can aim with the other thumbstick. So here you see the thumbstick spins him, and I move around using uh, the left thumb. The right thumb is aim, left thumb moves him. The second controller normally moves that character, but I've reconnected the second controller over to my laptop so I can do network testing instead. And we're gonna get rid of kind of having a second player locally to go for network multiplayer anyway, so I didn't wanna go back to it. But ideally, you get the idea that this would move around the other player and this one moves around the red player, and we just go around and blow up enemies. Actually, I have all the enemies turned off, so if I go over here and turn on one of my spawners to see some bad guys start to show up, let's see. And then you see that I've got robots here and I blow up the robots, I get points, they explode. And again, I'm gonna show you what that code looks like in just a second. We also have a score system here, keeping track of this player's score. And then we've got a high score in the middle that you can tell I kind of left my guy sitting there shooting straight at bots forever. But if I hit that button, it'll reset the high score. And then whenever we get a new high score, it should just become the high score. There we go, and that's our new high score. That saves off into player prefs. Let's um, jump really quickly into how the code works right now. And then we'll dive into implementing or importing mirror and well, turning it into a network game instead. So the current version of the code has only a couple of scripts. You can see here there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight scripts, it looks like. Yeah, not very many, and they're all very, very small. They're not complicated at all. If we look at like the bomb script here. Um, actually, which one should I go through first? Um, let's look at the I'm gonna look at the enemy script first. So the enemy is just walk towards the player, right? They're very simple. I'm gonna open up the script, take a look at it, and then we'll look at the player because I feel the enemy is simple, super simple. Player's a little bit more complicated. So we'll start with a very easy one. So the, actually in here, in Visual Studio, if you see, if you expand out the Solution Explorer here, one of the very few times that I like to do this, when I'm trying to go through and look at all of the code, it's very rare that I need to do this and use the Solution Explorer with the Unity project. But here, it's nice to see all of my code. So let's look at the enemy here. So the enemy is just a simple mono behavior, just a standard script like we would normally have. That's gonna change. It's got a prefab for when it gets hit. That's just the particle system, an explosion prefab for when it dies, some health, a score value that we can adjust for giving them you know, more and more points based on how difficult the enemies are. Then in on enable, we're caching an audio source and resetting our current health. We just cache the audio source here because we didn't have an awake and there's no point in adding it. So we just reset the health right here in on enable. And then in update, we look for the first player that we can find. It's very, very simple. It's not doing anything complex. It looks for the first player and then it sets its destination of its nav mesh agent 
to that player. So it'll find any player that's active in the scene. If there are two, it's going to always find that same player. So the one player is going to be in trouble, but whatever. We don't have to worry about randomizing it right now. And then we just get our nav mesh agent, set our destination to it. So this makes it just essentially follow a player. Now we probably should cache this or something, but that's not the point of this. We're going to multiplayer network stuff instead. A couple other things it does. It takes damage at a point. The reason it takes a point in there is so that we can spawn a particle. You see here we instantiate a particle. And then here we play an audio source when we get hit. Check to see if we are below zero health or at zero. Blow up. We'll play an explosion particle. Turn herself off. And then tell the score system to add some points. The only other thing that we do is check to see if we've run into a player. Here in on collision enter, if we've run into a player, we reload scene zero. So that's the kind of thing that we're going to need to maybe change when we do the, when we do this conversion, because we don't want it to just load scenes randomly. We got to do something a little bit different there or something a little bit more intelligent, or maybe just disable that for now. I don't know. Let's look at the player now. So the player moves around by just reading the two axes, the horizontal and vertical axes. I'm going to just scroll through the code real quick, but let's talk about the first couple fields up here. We have a speed field for just controlling how fast we're going. We have a transform named direction. I'm going to show you that in just a second. Another transform named shoot point and a player number. Now the transform named direction, if we just look in here, if I search for the word direction, you see that it's actually an object that I just have placed in the scene. I can hit F to go to it over here, clear the filter so it actually shows up and turn on the mesh render. You can see it's just a box that's lined up and notice the camera here. It's actually lined up to match the camera's rotation just with only the Y value set. So I'm using this as a transform that we'll use to, um, well, let, let me show you. Let's show you where it's actually referenced because we use that direction when we do our movement code. So oh, just keep that in mind for a second. I know I kind of jumped ahead for one second there, but I want, I want to make sure that you know what that is. Then we also have a shoot point. That's this little transform that's just on the end of the player's gun. If I go down here and look for, or to search for shoot point and click on it and expand it out right there and hit F to just zoom in. You see that it's just this little point kind of out at the end of the gun. If I hit play on it, you see that it kind of matches and lines up with the gun when the gun's animating. Here, let's just do it. Hit play and not just make you trust my word for it, right? So we hit scene view. Oh, actually it's an offset. Oh, I lied. It, it's actually down. I remember now I lowered it because the reason that it's lowered is so that these bullets will fly out low enough to hit the enemies. When they were firing from that actual shoot point part, um, they were too high and they were going above the enemy's head. So I lowered them down. Totally forgot that. Glad I covered it because I would have not mentioned it if I hadn't. All right, let's uh, dive back down into how it moves. So we've got the awake that caches the animator. And then in update, we move with a controller and we aim with a controller. So move with controller reads the horizontal and vertical axes. It reads horizontal plus our player number. So we read horizontal one for player one, horizontal two for player two. And then we do the same for vertical. Player number one reads vertical one, player two reads vertical two. We create a vector three named movement using just our X and Z because we don't want to go up and down on the Y axis. And then we just translate it using our movement vector times time dot delta time. So it's frame rate independent, multiply it by speed so we can control it. And then here's that transform I told you about the direction. So the second parameter here, this isn't a multiplication. This is a, a parameter there with a comma is this, the transform that it's relative to. So we're going to translate it in that direction relative to this direction object forward. So we're going to move it, you know, if we were going right on the X, then it's going to be right in relation to this direction object. So I just keep it easily lined up with the way that the camera is facing. And if I want, I can spin it around, flip the controls or whatever else. And I don't have to explain the math for translating that stuff. The other part we have is an aim with controller that just reads horizontal aim and vertical aim for our player numbers. And then it sets our forward to that vector so that we basically just snap towards whatever direction we're pushing here on the X and the Z. Let's go look at those um, input settings real quick. And then let's dive into, well, making it multiplayer because there's a lot of stuff here. Um, and well, actually, I'll look at one more thing. Let, let's go see, um, what did I just say I was going to look at? Like, oh, the inputs. We'll go to the input. So we'll go to edit and then project settings and input. Where's that? Input manager right there. So we expand out axes and you'll see that the controls that I've set up, the reason I want to show this is because if you see vertical and horizontal, those are default. If you see vertical one and horizontal one, you might think those are default. They do not exist by default. They're things that we've created. So we changed the horizontal down here to be horizontal one that reads from joystick axis one, and then made a horizontal two that reads from joystick axis two. Very simple stuff. And we just did the same for the aims, except for the aims, we had to change the axes here. It's axis four for aim two. And I think, um, I don't, I don't remember what it is for vertical. Actually, I think vertical was 
axis three. So a vertical is axis three for vertical one and vertical two instead of the Y axis, which was again, just for the PlayStation controllers, it's gonna depend on what they look like. All right, I'm, d I'm done talking about how it, how it works right now. I wanna get into the network side. Let's get into moving these players over the network, setting it up so we can actually run around. And then we'll talk about the different code like launching bullets and spawning them as we go through converting them. So the first step here is going to be to import the mirror library. Um, let's do that now. To get mirror, you'd first go to the asset store and you'd hit search online. You go into the asset store window. Let's see if I can pop that up here. And so you get your asset store window. It looks something like this. And then you search for mirror. Go up here find mirror and it should be just available. Oh, let's see, how do I get the mirror? There it is, mirror by viz2k. So you grab this and import it or add it to your assets really. Then you can hit open in Unity and it'll pop up in the Unity editor and go right to the package manager. The other way to do it if you already have the asset is to just open up the package manager window, make sure that you're on packages, my assets, and then just search for the word mirror and you'd find it here. I didn't need to search for it, let's search for it anyway search for mirror you see it filters down i've got mirror and multiplay mirrors the one we're going to use though and then we'll just import it into the project this shouldn't take too long but it's not the tiniest project it wasn't very big though let's see i'll give it a couple seconds real quick and i'll take a drink um by the way anybody here used mirror it's just show of hands how many people here have used mirror in the past in chat while i take a drink and we import this uh. All right, almost in, it's importing. Any time now. It's busy for 30, this is taking longer than I thought. Okay, there we go, it looks like it just finished up. So we should have a mirror folder here and then this mirror folder should be full of examples. Let me just hit play, make sure that I can still compile, everything works after importing it. Oh, looks good. And then we'll go jump over to one of those example scenes. So I'm gonna go into the examples folder. They've got a very basic example and it's got, let's see, in scenes, example, I'll save my scene because I don't know if I've changed anything in level one and we'll go take a look at it. So this scene doesn't really have anything in it. If you look around, like, I don't think there are actually any objects in it at all, are there? See anything on the canvas? There might be something here that shows up on the canvas. But when I hit play, you're gonna see what the default mirror setup looks like. So by default, we get this little GUI here, this little old school UI that has a host plus server button or a client button or a server only button. I'm gonna hit host server plus client. And this has essentially started up a network server and connected me to it. Obviously it's extremely boring because there's nothing going on here. I'm the only player and it's just showing that uh, a data number, which totally doesn't, well, oh, I, I don't think it impresses anybody. It doesn't impress me. So first step is gonna be to set up our second player. I wanna make sure that before I go into modifying my, uh, my current code in my current game, that I can connect their example. So that way, if there's an issue with my setup or something that I'm doing, I know that it's with my setup and it's not something with mirror. Number one, first, first step, first rule, get it working with the example, make sure it works, and then we'll go on to our own stuff. So to get it working with the example, we need two instances of this thing running. I could either run two Unity instances, which is something I would do a lot of the time, but, and it was something I heavily considered. There are a lot of really cool assets and tricks for doing this. Um, but this time I wanted to show how to do it with builds because I think most people are gonna do it with builds. And it, it if you're not doing too much debugging, it's about the same. You don't get as much benefit of doing it from two editors. Two editors is nice, don't get me wrong. I always recommend it, but that's not how I wanna do it in this video. So we're gonna go into edit or file and we're gonna go to build settings and we're gonna create a build of our example level and then we'll connect it to our local editor one and see if it works. So to do that, I need to add my open scene or add the example scene and then just hit build and run and I'm gonna give it a folder. I made a folder called build. I'm just gonna build right out to that. Just right off my root, I just made an empty folder that I could build this to. It's gonna put the executable there and all of my tiny little bit of data. So we should get an example window that pops up. And if I haven't changed it, it might pop up full screen and make it all kinds of weird. I guess we'll see in just a second. There we go, yep, it popped up full screen. I hit Alt Enter and now I've got this giant window that goes all the way across my screen. So before we, well, yeah, you know what? Let's connect it, let's see if it works and then let's fix it. So here, hopefully you can still see this window. I've got the little host spot right up here. I'm gonna click the button to host the server. I've got my player data right there in this window that's way off the screen. And then we'll hit play in Unity, close out this build settings window. 
and then we'll see if we can connect. So I hit client to connect to my local host. Here, let's, let's can I scale that up. Ah, it's not gonna scale up. Well, there we go. And look, I can connect. I've got player zero and player one. Seems like it's working so far. All good. So I'm gonna close out my big giant window that scrolls off the screen. And let's switch it to windowed mode and make it nice and tiny. This is something that you're always going to want to do when you're building out these multiplayer games. So we're going to go on to go to edit and then project settings, or I could have done it from the build and hit project settings. And then we'll go to, let's see, where is this one? I always forget this section. I think it's player. That's right. And then full screen window will change to windowed. And then I'll just leave the default resolution of 1024 by 768. Something nice and small. Save. And now let's try, um, well, I don't know if I want to try another scene. I feel like trying a bunch of sample scenes is kind of tedious. Just like, hey, look, something else moved. Let's make our own thing move. So let's set it up now so that our, our scene can have a network manager and we can connect and see where, where we got to go from there. So we'll go into the existing working version of the game. So go to scenes, go to level one, go out of 2D mode, and let's go find the player real quick. Just zoom down a little bit. So this version works. We can run around with the controllers. Let's add a network manager and see what that does. So we'll start by just going to, well, actually, I wonder if there's a prefabs folder in here. Do they have a prefabs folder? A network, I, I think they just have scripts in there. I don't know. I'm just gonna create my own. So the way that I generally do is go create empty, call it network manager, and then add a network manager component and save. So now if I hit play, you're gonna see that, well, we're not gonna notice any difference, right? Everything's gonna be, Pretty much exactly the same. I can still run around with my controller and shoot, and I don't have that little UI. I don't have that HUD there. So I'm gonna stop playing, and first we'll add the HUD. The HUD is actually a separate component. You add the network manager. It auto adds the transport, which is like the network communications layer. You can swap it out for different types of games, um, different scenarios that you might need. But this is the default one though. But we need to add in the, oh look, I have network manager already filtered. Network manager HUD, that's the one we want. So I'll save that. We'll hit play one more time and see where we're at. There we go, we've got a UI now. I still have a bunch of guys standing here shooting and I can hit host and well, I mean, that's about it. If I, uh, it's not doing anything else, it's letting me start and letting me run, but it's not actually gonna work as a network game. Let me show you why. Watch if, as we build out it, our scene. So I'll go to build settings. Let's add our open scene, delete out that example one. I'll save, hit build and run. We'll let it do a quick build. And then let's just watch what happens on the client and on the server. You might have noticed that like right away it's starting up with two players already in there shooting. We haven't connected two players. Obviously it's because we haven't actually done the code, but let's go through it anyway. So here we go. It loads up. Ah, where'd my Unity window go? There we go. We've got this instance of it here that moves around with this controller. And then if I hit play here, I should be able to start up a server here. Let's see, I host a server. Let's go over to the other window here. See if I can connect to the server. Yep, and now I'll move around this character on this controller or this system and you can see like, oh, it moves, but it's not synchronized. It's not actually doing anything. They are connected. They're just not sending any useful data back and forth. In fact, if I go in here and just turn on my spawner, you see that enemies will spawn on one, here, I'll turn on all these spawners. Enemies are gonna spawn, or I'll just do that one, I guess. There, and oh, look at that. The guy died and the whole level reloaded and stuff. So there's obviously a bit more to it than just, um, than just putting in a network manager and having it magically Work, right so let's go through the process of making it actually work if we expand out the network manager you see that one of the first things here is this player prefab it's, i said it's first thing it's like first thing that you should really pay attention to and know about the player prefab is going to be this object that gets spawned for every player that comes into the game so when a player joins your game it's going to spawn a prefab for that player and associate it with that player's network connection and you use that to well communicate with the player and make them play the game so we need to assign a player prefab. If I hit the little search box and go through my assets, well, let's see if I can find player. Go to assets and search for player, player one. There we go, bam. So I can select player one, but look at that. It just cleared right out. So it didn't actually select it even though it looked like it was going to. If you look down here, right at the bottom, hopefully that's on the screen, it looks like it is. It says that the network manager player prefab must have a network identity. The problem is that I'm trying to assign a prefab that's not set up yet. So let's go into the setup process for making a networkable prefab. We need to go into our player. So here's our player prefab. And right now I don't think I have, oh, I do have some overrides. So I'm just gonna apply my overrides, which are just positional stuff to it. And then we're gonna go open up the prefab mode. So I'll just double click on it, or here, hit the little arrow and open up prefab mode. Now, 
on the prefab, it said I needed a network identity. So let's collapse all of these fields here or all of these components and add a network identity. Let's start searching and it should show right up. Now I can save this off, go back out of prefab edit mode and let's try assigning it now. So I've got my network manager. I'm gonna go into my prefab folder and get the player from there. I don't want the player that's placed in my scene. I'm gonna get this prefab right there and assign it. And now it actually shows up and works. Well, kind of works. So it should at least spawn that player now whenever I connect. So let's test this out by just taking our two players that are in the scene and just disabling. I just wanna get rid of them, but I don't really wanna delete them. So I'm just gonna disable them, kind of move them. Save it off and hit play and see what happens. By the way, while we're playing, if you guys don't mind hitting like, subscribe and share and all that stuff, really appreciate it. All right, so we host and look at that. We got a player that shows up. Let's see if I can move the player around. That I can even move the player around. So a player spawns and the player is movable. Looking good so far, right? All right, so we'll stop playing, save again, and I'm gonna do a build and run and let's try it network. All right, there we go. So we've got our scene up here. I'm gonna, let's see. I'm gonna make the Unity editor the host. So I'll go in here and hit play and start hosting. And then we'll go in and we'll join with a client. Now I'm in here with two characters. Let's see what happens when I move around. So this one is moving around both of my characters on the, the client scene here. And on the server one, I can move them around too. But they're never moving together. If I go over here, look. I move this one, they're moving. Here I move these ones, they're moving. What's actually happened is they spawn two player ones and they're still using that same player's movement setup. So we need to actually make the movement synchronized now and make it more controlled so that only one player or one, well, yeah, well you can only control your own player essentially so that you're not controlling both players. So let's stop playing, let's close this out and drag this back over here. And then let's, um, let's see, what do we wanna do? I think we wanna go into our player script now. So we need to actually change the player script to make it so that it's a network behavior instead of a um, instead of just a mono behavior so that we can control who can move it around and who has ownership on, and control over it. So stop playing, we'll go into our player script. So I'm just gonna select the player, expand out the player script here and just double click on it to open it up. All right, so here's our player script and the change that we're gonna make to it is pretty simple. We're gonna replace the mono behavior here with a network behavior. So I'll just go up here and I'll put a network behavior with the same uh, behavior spelling that mono behavior uses. Hit alt enter and it's gonna ask me to add a using mirror statement up there. So that's enough to make this into just a networked object or a network controllable object. And if you're used to mono behaviors, remember that mono behaviors have a whole bunch of built-in properties and methods that you can use and override. Network behavior is kind of the same. If I hit F12, I can just go into the definition and see a whole bunch of things like is server, is client, is local player, is server only, um, all kinds of different things down here. I'm not even sure all of the different options here, but we can override the way that it serializes data, deserializes data, and I think quite a few other things. Right now though, all we care about is looking at whether or not this player should be controlled by the local system. So on player, the first player, the host, it should be controlled by the server. The second one should be controlled only by the client that connects to it. And the third one by the client that connects the third one and so on. So we're gonna add in a little check around our movement and aiming code to check to make sure that it's the correct player. So all we gotta do is go to our update. And here we'll say if input dot, no, not if input, if is local player, then we'll do that code or run this. In fact, let's change it. So if, if is local player is equal to false return. We could also just add a not local player, but I'm just gonna leave it like this. So if it's not the local player, we won't allow control over it anymore. If we go in here and we hit play, I should still be able to move my, con my player around when I spawn him because he'll be the first one on here. Let's try it out. Hit play and I can move this one player around. Looks good. Um, I'm not sure why there's a second player there. That was a little bit odd. Um, what, what was going on there? Let's hit play again. Host. And I got a player. Oh, my other player turned on, that's why. 
it was uh something just flipped that script on. I think there's something in the code that was turning it on. So actually, I probably just need to remove that from the scene. In fact, let's do that. So I'll stop, go in here. I'm going to delete out my other two players that shouldn't be in there and then save it off. So you did see though that I was able to move it around, I think. So let's try, I'm going to build two, do a build, connect two, and then make sure that each one can only control its local player and see if we get the network players moving or not. So go to file, build and run, because I already have this scene set up as my only scene. Okay. Well, and let's do it. Okay, so we're in. We'll hit play. There seemed to be a bunch of arguing in chat, so just killed it. No need. All right, so we hit play, and we can move around this player, and let's go into the other one, and we'll join with the second player. And now I can only move around this player. So second one only moves around its player. First one only moves around its player, but nothing synchronized. The players still aren't moving together. They're not moving on each other's scenes. So we'll stop playing and add the next step. Next step is still very simple. Notice that we haven't really had to write much code or do much at all yet. So we'll go into here and see how easy it is. So we'll go to the player and we've got a network identity. Let's hit add component. I, I'm gonna actually go through the list here and just give a quick kind of a preview of what all is in there. There's a lot of stuff in here. If we look at the network options under add component, you see there's a network animator, network discovery, some logging stuff, a lobby manager, all kinds of things. Um, oh man, and they're just off the screen, the ones that I wanna select, so I'll collapse these down a little bit more. The one that we want though is just this network transform. If I use this, it's actually going to just synchronize the position and rotation and scale of my object. So I can click on that, save. I'll do a file save project, because remember this is on the prefab and prefabs get saved when we hit save project. And then I'll do another build and run and let's see what this does. Now it has a bunch of settings for optimizing the network throughput and the position um, or the, the the throughput and the the speed of how, how often it's synchronized and stuff. We're not gonna play with it too much. How much you need to adjust it and what you need to do there is gonna depend dramatically on the type of game that you're building. But our game should work fine without making much adjustment there at all. So I'm gonna go in, hit play. And we'll start a server and I can run around looking good. All right, and then we'll go into the client and we'll join as a client and move around. And well, I'm not moving there. Let's see if I'm moving here. So I'll get my other client up. There we go. And I'm able to move this one. Okay, so partially working, right? This player, the host is able to replicate its movement data down and the client is not. So I think I know why that is. Let's stop playing and go check. Actually, I'm gonna leave it running real quick and just go check. So I believe there's a setting on the player. Yep, there it is. On the network transform, the client authority option. If this isn't set, then it's controlled. Um, it, its movement won't be forced by the client. So if the client moves around, it won't move on the server, it won't move anywhere else. Client authority means essentially, let the client be in charge of saying where its own player is. This is usually what you wanna have a lot of times. Some games will not have client authoritative movement, most games tend to have relatively client authoritative movement, but then they do some extra checking to make sure that your, your movements are actually legitimate and realistic and that you're not cheating them. So they might not know for sure that you actually did the movement, but they'll know whether or not your movement was possible. In our case though, we're gonna just check client authority because we really want our clients to be able to move and we don't really need to add any cheat detection. Now, when it comes to client authority on actual actions, like shooting things, blowing stuff up, you never want to allow that. But for movement, it's generally, it's kind of a default and a common thing because you want to have nice, snappy, smooth movement. And then you kind of smooth it out over the network for everybody else. All right, so let's stop this client and then we'll do another build and run real quick with our client authority on. So I've got it on, on my prefab. I'm going to make sure it's on for the prefab. Do a file, build and run one more time and we'll get it going. Oh, getting thirsty here. Oh, thanks for all the super chats, by the way, guys. I got it kind of off the screen, so I haven't been seeing it nearly as much. I'm gonna try to keep an eye on the chat a little bit as I flap through the stuff. Unfortunately, like with the mirror stuff, it's somewhat not fresh to me or not new to me or somewhat new to me, I mean. So I get a little bit engulfed, just staring right at it. All right, so we'll start our server there and I can move around. Looks good. 
join our client and I can move around. Look at that. It's moving on both of them. I think it's looking pretty good. And this one's moving on both of them as well. You might notice though that like watch when I move, that dude's not animating, right? And if I move this guy, that one's not animating. And that's because the movement code that's doing the animation is actually being bypassed. So I'm going to stop. We'll go fix that. And then let's uh, we'll figure out what the next step will be. So I'll stop playing. I'm going to go into our player. And the player is actually setting up its movement using the animator. So the animator here in move with controller sets a run Boolean, which is just a true or false parameter to true if our movement magnitude is greater than zero. So if we're moving, it's true. If it's false, it just sets it to zero. So this code needs to be run kind of regardless of whether or not we're a local player, right? That's my thought on it. But we don't have this movement stuff if we're not a local player. So why don't we just get the rigid body and get the velocity of that and use that instead? So I'm going to go into my network shooter, just double check that my player has a rigid body on it. Let's see. Yep, it's got a rigid body right there. So I'll just use the rigid body components velocity instead of my movement vector here. I'm going to take this line of code right here on 36. I'm just going to cut it and move it right up here. So we'll say animator.setbool run, and we'll just set it to our rigid body dot velocity, which doesn't exist yet. The rigid body isn't cached yet, dot magnitude. So let's create that. I'm going to turn awake into a regular method instead of an expression body. So we'll just switch that back, and we'll say underscore rigid body equals get component rigid body. Save that off and generate a field. Alt enter and generate field should give us a field right up here. And I'll just delete the extra private keyword that I don't need. So that should make them start syncing up the animation or making the animation not really network synced, but we already know that we're moving. So let's see if that works. Let's try it out. Go in and I'm pretty sure this isn't going to work, by the way. The more I think about it, our velocity. Yeah, our velocity value isn't, um, let me think about it, because our, our, we're not using the rigid body to move. We're using the transforms translate to move. So we need to sync it some other way. Actually, you know what? How do I want to do this? I'm trying to think. I kind of want to use a sync bar, even though I, I feel like I shouldn't. Um, we could also just cache and check to see if our position has changed and then set it to running or something. Um, I'm going to... Oh, this is a tough one. I'm trying to decide. Should I add a sync var here? Let's try that. I haven't actually at, used the sync vars before, so let's try it out. We add a sync var for bool running. And then we'll just set it to whether or not we're running. And then here in the move, we could set that sync vars value to this. Let's see, running equals, and we'll switch back to the movement dot magnitude. And I think that'll work. I'm not sure though. It's been a little while since I tried the, uh, the sync bars. Oh, network animator is a great idea too. I didn't even think of that. Let's try this out real quick and then we'll jump over to the network animator component. That's not one I've actually used on here. So I think it's probably a good solution for it. So here we've got, let's see, where's our player? Our player's got its variable. Um, let's try a build. Build and run and see if it works. And then again, if this doesn't work, maybe I'll just switch over to the uh, network animator. Let's see what, how that works and, and what that's like. And then we get into spawning bullets, spawning enemies, and blowing them up over the network and all that stuff. Right now we're spawning them all locally and it's not going to work network. So I'm going to make sure that I get into that stuff too. All right, so we'll hit play. Post and client and let's see I move around oh nope it does not seem to sync not sure what i missed there let's see what am i missing here on the sync bar let me just look it up real quick so we need to use a mirror sync bar and we just pull it up sync bar needs oh does it need to be public let's see players blah, blah, blah. state of sync bar is applied on start client also up to date on start client sync bars can use any type it's when the value of the var changes, so you don't need to track it. Um, in this example, so let's see. I'm just doing a real quick check here. So when we set it, oh, it's because we're not setting it on the client. That okay, got it. So I, I realized the issue right away. So okay, no, I didn't realize the issue because this should still 
yeah, there we go. So look at this. Here it is. I, I get it now. Let me explain this too, because this is an important thing, and it's going to be um, an issue for everybody. And I'll look into the uh, network animator in just a second, but I'll talk about the sync var thing for a second, because you might have thought that this was going to work, and without me thinking it through, I thought it was going to work, right? So right now I can move around this player, and the second screen here animates. You can see the player here animates, even though I'm controlling it from this one. If I move this guy though, the other one doesn't animate. So the client or the server here isn't getting the animation. What actually happens here is these sync vars only get sent from the server out to all the clients. If you set a sync var on the client, it is not going to set it on the server and to everything else. For that, you need to use a command. And a command is set up. Let's see if we, I'm just going to go through it. Let's just do it real quick. So a command is set up essentially like this. You give it a command attribute, you make a public method, and then you set some data there and it's going to run on the server. Let's do it. So we'll go over to Unity and on our player, let's add a command that sets our move with, um, or sets our running state. Again, this is probably not the ideal way to do it. I don't really want to be sending a command every frame that's going to um, set whether or not I'm running, but I want to show how to do it because I think it's an important thing to show how to do real quick. And it's really, really simple to do. So I'll add a command and here I'll say public void set run, pool run. So just, it's going to be a true or false on whether or not run is true. Let's actually get this up to the top of the screen there. And then here we'll say underscore running equals run. Actually, let's rename that to running. Make our variable names set look good. And then here we'll just call set run and we'll pass in our value of true or false there. So now what will happen is we'll call this method. And if we're on the server, it's just going to call directly into our set run method. So if this is our first player, it's going to call set run, set it. And then the sync bar is going to pick it up. If it's on the client, it's going to send a network message down that says, hey, set this variable to this value. Of course, setting it every frame is probably a terrible waste of network bandwidth and not a great idea, but I want to do it anyway, just because um, why not? What we really want to do is maybe just set this only when it changes or something. So let's try it out. Let's give it a go. We'll go into Unity again and do a build and run. We'll go back over to Unity. Stop playing. File, build and run. And we'll push this out. All right. Oh, the question about do we need to put CMD for the name? That's a good question. Does it require CMD for its command names? I hope not. That would be really annoying, but it might be the case. I assumed that the attribute was enough. I guess we'll find out in one second. Let's hit play and see. All right. So we're in. We'll host and move around look at that and then we'll join a client and run around look at that it's working so now our synchronization is good to go so we've got simple state variable synchronization and some simple movement and oh also rotation i guess i didn't really spin around much but there you go now you can see me rotating and spinning on both of them and rotating and spinning on the other ones by the way when i want to go over to hooking up to the network it's extremely easy all i have to do is uh Oh, put it onto another device and change the IP address. Make sure that I open up the network. So, all right, let's see what's next. Um, what should we do? We've got movement. We've got animation kind of working. I, I did kind of want to play the, um, the, the, with the network animator, but I think I want to dive into something else like, uh, either spawning enemies or maybe spawning bullets or something else. Um, I'm inclined towards spawning enemies first so that we have something to hit the bullets with. Um, everybody kind of agree or anybody got any thoughts on that in chat? You guys wanted to see bullets, enemies, or is there something else you'd rather see first? I mean, we could even do the bombs first, I guess, but I feel like the enemies are probably the right way to go. And it gives me a chance to take a drink while everybody says what they want. Oh, okay. Okay, so there were some questions too in chat real quick. I just wanted to answer about sync bars and commands. So the sync bar is essentially one that you're going to set on the server. So you set it up on the server and it's a variable that whenever it changes on the server, it'll update to the clients. And then the command is the thing that you send from the clients over to the server. You got to also remember though that when you do a server, like a host and server client thing at the same time, like I've been doing, you're running as both of those. You have a client and a server and it kind of works as both. So 
when you send a command from the server to itself, it's actually going to run that kind of, just like it would if it were a networked one, but without having to go over the network. All right, so let's go through the um, the enemy system now, or spawning enemies. Right now, our enemies spawn with this spawner. And if I do, a, let's do another build and run, and let's see what happens if I turn on the spawner. Actually, I didn't turn on the spawner first. I'll turn the spawner on, we'll do a build and run, and we'll see um, what that looks like when we have enemies spawning. I think I'll turn on, let's see, which spawners do I got? I got, let's turn on like these two. One or zero and two. So I've got these spawners here. By the way, let's take a real quick look at what these look like. So this spawner object is just a cube and it's, or it's really just an object with a box collider and a mesh render and a spawner script on it. It's got spawn points on it. So it's just an array of points. And that's what all of these cubes are. I left them visible. They're just the different points that the enemy could spawn at so that I can have a little bit of variability. And then it has a set of enemies down here as well in the spawner script. I'll open up the script and you see that all it does is check to see if it should spawn. And if it should spawn, it spawns. It determines if it should spawn by checking to see if the current time is greater than or equal to the next spawn time. So whenever we should spawn again. And then when it spawns, it just chooses an enemy. So we, we reset our spawn time. We pick a random spawn point from our list of spawn points there, or our array of spawn points. And then we pick a random enemy from our array of enemies. And we instantiate the enemy at the point. Not a whole lot to it. But it's not going to work over the network, is it? Let's try it. Should we do our build? Did I do a build and run already? Nope. Let's do a build and run. Oh, thanks for Super Chats. Anything else going on in chat while I build and run? Oh, on building your own. So it looks like a little bit of chat about building your own libraries too. If you're curious about building your own network libraries, it's it's a lot of work. It's it's definitely a complex thing to do. And it's the thing that you probably want to do once your game is starting to get to the point where you need it, where the existing solutions don't work. Or if you've already built enough network games that you know that any existing solutions aren't going to work. But for most games, the stuff that's out there will usually handle the kind of game that you want to build. All right, so let's host our server. And then let's see, we got some enemies coming in here. Oh man, that's a lot of them. And let's let's join in on a client here. So you can see, well, obviously they look very desynchronized, right? The enemies here are nowhere near what the enemies here were. I, and I died really, really fast. So I'm gonna turn off death real quick and then try it again. Well, I'll turn off death and then let's just start making them spawn over the network instead of spawning on their own. So I'm gonna turn off death mostly so I don't keep loading into that scene as as it plays. Like I don't wanna get touched by an enemy and it dies. So here I'll just disable the death by going into our enemy script and just commenting out the part that loads the scene when we get touched by the enemy that reloads our game right now. And then let's go to our spawner and figure out how we're going to instantiate an enemy over the network instead of instantiating an enemy on every client. Because right now it's spawning for every client. The client has its own set of enemies that are totally unrelated to the network. So we need to go to our spawners first. And our spawners need to do some work so that they only spawn on the server. So we'll open up the spawner script. And I guess if we're not on the server, we probably don't need to run the update at all. So we could say if is server. Uh, oh, we can't check if we're on the server though, because it's not a network behavior. So we'll change the mono behavior to network behavior. Oh, uh, hit alt enter and add the using statement for using mirror. Now we can see if is server is false then we'll just return because we don't want to run this code on the client. That should be enough to prevent the client from seeing any enemies spawning at all. That's not gonna make the game actually work though because we want the enemies to show up on the other side. So the next thing that we need to do is actually spawn the enemies over the network. And it's, I was surprised at just how easy it is to do with Mirror because there's really not much to it. All we need to do is get an instance of our enemy here and then call a network server method on it. So I'm gonna rename this enemy instance right here where we choose an enemy to enemy prefab. Just because I wanna say enemy, enemy equals this. Oh, I wanna spell enemy right though. There you go. So now I'm instantiating an enemy into enemy using this prefab name. And I'm gonna take this enemy object and I'm going to spawn it over the network. To do that, we do network server. Let's see if I can spell it right. I cannot spell today network server dot spawn and we pass in our enemy dot game object we have to give it the game object now there's obviously one other step that i haven't done yet which is to make our enemy into a networkable game object i think if i go in and hit play we'll probably see an error let's try it though because i'm kind of curious what the error message would look like we jump in we hit host and oh 
Any enemies showing up? Nope, but we have some errors here. So there's no network identity on the spawner. No network identity on the spawner. And here there's an exception on line 49. So I need to add a network identity to my spawner. So I'll stop playing. Add component, network identity. There we go, it's added. Let's collapse some of this other stuff down. We got a spawner with our network identity and it should be on the server only, right? This is a server only object. I don't want it spawning on the client. So we'll save, hit play. Let's try this out. Host and server. And well, I still have errors because I didn't add it to all of my other ones, but you do see some enemies are starting to spawn. So it's actually starting to spawn the enemies. Let's see, um, well, let's fix it on the other ones and then see if it actually spawns them over the network. So I'll select my other three spawners add a network identity. We'll save. Oh, let's check server only. Do a build and run so we can get a client up and then see if um if the enemies spawn over the network or not or if there's anything else we need to do to them. Probably is another step. My guess is that our enemies are going to need to be set up as network objects with their own network identities. But let's see what happens if we don't do that. So we jump in here, we'll hit play. I'll start hosting on this one right here and join as a client. And let's see, oh, look at that. I've got error messages right here saying that the cute things have no network identity and I've got nobody showing up here. You can see the character is getting pushed around by the bad guys. So look at that, this guy's getting just kind of moved around. A little bit strange, but let's go fix it up now. Let's stop playing. And let's go add our network identities to those moving dudes. So go to our prefabs, go to the enemies folder, select all four of them. I'm gonna collapse all of these scripts and we'll add a network identity. Now I also want this thing to move around just like it does with the clients or just like the players do. So let's add a network transform as well. Uh, as far as animations go, these dudes literally just animate nonstop. So I don't think I need to do anything else there. Um, I think I can just save this off and do a build and run. And we probably are going to have enemies walking and moving in sync. Let's see if it works. Maybe I missed something, but I don't know. Why not? Oh, you're welcome for the kind of somebody mentioning the dapper dapper dino in here. Cool. Oh, hey, what's up, man? I see you. Uh, just saw the chat. And, oh, thanks for the super chat, too. Sweet. Nice to have you in here. That was a fun chat yesterday, too. If anybody missed it, go check it out. We did a live stream. Uh, well, go check it out after this. The live stream just talking about game development and stuff. It was a lot of fun. All right, so here we go. We'll host and we will join and I'll move around. Look, I got enemies spawning. Oh, no, what? Let's see. My enemies are moving here on the client. They're not spawning, or they're moving here on the server. They're not spawning on the client. What is going on here? I must have missed something. Let's take a quick look. So I'm gonna pause and find an enemy. Let's go select one. It's got a network transform. Should be spawning. It's, let's see. Oh, it has two network transforms. Uh-oh, I've got an issue here. And it's got two network identities. That seems like a problem. I think I might have messed up here. Let's go back into my project view and go double check these. Yep, how did I do that? How did I double add a network identity? Let's remove and remove and double check these guys. This one has two. So somehow I added extra components. Whoops. I, I literally, I don't remember doing that. Maybe I, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I did. That's all good though. We'll fix it up. So we've got our components fixed up now. I think we got a network transform. This guy, this guy, this guy, I think there, oh, I know there's one other issue. Watch this, I know what's happening. Sorry, there were two problems here. One is I had extra components on there. And two is that there's actually, to spawn game objects over the network, there's another requirement. And it's one that I completely just spaced on, this registered spawnable prefabs option right here on our network manager. So on our network manager, we need to define which objects we can spawn over the network. I'm gonna hit plus and I'm gonna hit it four times and add in all of my enemies that I wanna spawn over the network because that's something that I need to do. Here we go, we'll I'll go assign them all and save one more time, do a build and run and I think we should be good to go now. To actually spawn some guys there. Again, just double checking that it didn't have two of the components on there and making sure that they're actually set up as spawnable prefabs. Let's try it out. All right, we're in almost. So we'll host, move around a little, join. Look at that, I've got enemies moving and they're chasing. It's a little bit stuttery here, but they are chasing and moving around and it seems like it's kind of working. 
So there's something else going on though. Um, if I stop playing and go back into the code and let's take a look at our enemy, the way that it works. There's something that people aren't gonna notice if they haven't gone through this code before or they didn't write it. And it's that our enemy right now, let's see, I'll zoom out a bit. It's synchronizing its position over the network. It's being moved by the server. Every frame, the server is saying, hey, go set your destination. The nav mesh agent on the server is saying, hey, move to your position. And then the transform sync is saying, hey, here's my new position. But look, in the update, it's also doing the same thing on the client. And then the sync is happening on the server and sending the position down. So it's actually moving on both places and then fighting back and forth between the client and the server. So all I'm gonna do here on the update is say, if is server is equal to false return uh, or re ret run, I guess. Let's, let's change that to a return. And then we need to make the is server work because that's not there right now because this is not a network behavior. But if I go to the top with control home and change mono to network, hit alt enter and add the using statement, it should now show up. So if I scroll down, now my is server is false is good. And it should only move on the server and not do the movement on the client. So now we have server authoritative NPC or enemy movement. Let's try it out. Go back into Unity and we'll do another build and run. See if it works. And then, uh, yeah, I guess we'll just run around. Hopefully you have some enemies there. By the way, I also just wanted to say, while we're waiting, thanks to everybody for showing up. It's kind of crazy having this many people just hop into a stream and watch and join in and, and commenting and talking and stuff. It's a blast and so kind of amazing. Also, if you guys don't mind hitting like and get it up to like a thousand, that'd be awesome too. Like, but yeah, <laughs> okay, let's try it out now. I forgot, I gotta say something while it's running. All right, so I hit play, run around and it looks good. And I join on my client and there we go. Now that stuttering has kind of disappeared. It's now nice and smooth. It looks pretty good. I can run around, blast enemies, and it's uh, well, somewhat working. I mean, to be honest, it feels a lot like the game is kind of working. There are some issues going on here, though. A lot of the things are still very client authoritative. In fact, we may start to see things get a little bit out of sync if we, if we play enough and we kill things right. So the reason for this is really just that our players right now are... Um, dealing with all of their bullets, all the collisions and everything else on their client. So let's take a look at that and see how we can maybe fix that up. So if we go back into Unity and we go over to our, let's let's take a look at the, let me think, what do I want to take a look at? You guys want to do the destruction of enemies over the network or shooting with bullets over the network first? Because we can do either one. We could either start spawning bullets over the network and make sure that, that that's all synchronized. Or we could do a, um, a thing where the, the enemy destruction is actually synchronized. That if we kill an enemy on one, it's always killed on the other. And it's not just like your two guys moving around, but you have to kill it on both. And the bullets just have to link up or sync up. Looks like there's some, some interest in the bullet stuff. So I think I'll start with that. Let's do bullets first. And then we'll do, um, do enemy destruction next. So to set up our bullets, uh, remember we needed to add them to the network manager. Let's do that first. We'll add a registered spawnable prefab. Plus there, go into prefabs and find the bullet prefab. And then we'll take a look at what the bullet prefab actually looks like. Oh, I can't assign the bullet prefab because well, it doesn't have a network behavior. So let's go take a look at that network or that behavior now, or the, get my word right. Let's go take a look at that prefab, the bullet prefab. All right, so the bullet prefab is pretty simple. It's a spear. Let's just drag one out here into the scene. It's a white little dot. It's got a bullet script on it, a rigid body. The rigid body doesn't have anything locked. It's set to what? Continuous mode and anything else on here? Nope, a collider and a renderer. Very, very simple object. I'm going to delete the one from the scene. Go into, oh, try that again. Delete the one from the scene. Go to the prefab and let's add a network identity. Let's type in the word identity because. Apparently I cannot spell network anymore. All right, so we've got a network identity here. It should not be server only. We want bullets to replicate on the client and server. Go back to the network manager and assign the bullet. There we go. Now I wanna go over to my shooting script or my gun script. Let's go take a look at that. Look at our player. You see that it has a gun script on it and the gun references the bullet prefab has a delay and the speed that it launches the bullet at. Let's go take a look at it. So our gun script here, it's very similar to our other ones in that it just has a simple update with a, if can shoot, then shoot. 
is pretty much it. So if we can shoot, we'll do some shooting. Um, we have a direction vector here. I'm not sure why. I'm going to delete that because it's not used. And then we have a queue of bullets here that we use to pull the bullets. So if you've never used a pooling system before, let me really briefly explain what it is. When we spawn objects in Unity or in a lot of things, we create an object and allocate some memory for that, spawn it up, create the thing. It has a small performance hit. Uh, and reclaiming that memory afterwards also has a small performance hit. Over time, it can build up into a big performance hit. So one of the tricks that we'll use is to build out a pool or just a big collection of things that we can reuse. So I'll build out like a thousand bullets and just grab a bullet that's already spawned and used or spawned and available and ready, use that bullet. And then when it's ready to be destroyed, instead of destroying it, we just kind of put it back into that list. Here, we're not doing a thousand. We just do however many we need. When we run out, we create a new one. And when we are done with it, we re-add it back into our pool. So let's take a look at how the rest of the bullet shooting works, and then we'll set it up to be a network side or a network setup for it. So in our update, we check to see if we can shoot. Let's go look at it. So can shoot just checks to see if we this essentially should be should shoot. Let's rename it back. Should shoot because it's not really can, it's a should. We should shoot whenever our time meets the next time. Then we call shoot. We've set our next shooting time so that we can have that delay that which just kind of refreshes automatically. To our current time plus the delay we get a bullet from our bullet pool so this is the part that's using the pooling it checks to see if there's anything in the pool if there is it grabs one using the dq which just gets the first one available sets it to active if not we create a new one and we sell, set its gun so we say hey bullet when you're done hitting something you go blow up um reset yourself to this gun's pool this gun has its own pool of bullets that are reused come back to it other than that, well, we've got the bullet here on line 27. We set our position to go to that shoot point, which was at that point right at the end of the gun or a little bit below so we don't go over their head. We use the rotation, even though I don't really care about the rotation. Actually, I lied. We use the rotation because right here on the next line, we set our velocity to the object's forward times a bullet speed. So that's how we launch out our bullets. So all we need to do here is spawn these objects over the network and then set their velocity, right? Let's try it out. So we get a bullet, we spawn a bullet. Well, let's see where we spawn it. We spawn a bullet right here on line 42. So when we spawn it, let's add it to the network server. Say network server dot spawn. Let's zoom in a bit and get this nice and big. And we'll pass in our bullet dot game object. Now I need to add a using statement because network server is not showing up. So I hit alt enter and add the using mirror statement, which should be right up there. There we go. Save that off with control S. Let's go back down. Where was my code? There it is. So I think that should be enough to just spawn my bullet over the network, right? So my bullet should get created and appear over the network. Set guns probably not going to get called over the network if I need to call it from somewhere else or something, but that's not an issue I want to deal with right now. And I don't know if they're going to launch out. Let's see. Let's save it off. Let's go back into Unity. Let's make sure that our bullet has that has a network identity, right? And then let's do a build and run. Let's see how this goes. All right, almost done. And we'll hit play in Unity. I'm gonna start a host. I probably should turn off all of these, all these enemies because they're just gonna be distracting. And then I'll start my client. And well, things are kind of happening. You might notice that some weirdness is going on, right? So let's take a look. My first first thing to notice is that over here, this player or both players seem to be shooting out just fine. But on the client, the server or the client isn't getting the server's bullet movement. So the bullets are just kind of sitting still. You can see that they're just kind of stacking up there. If I move that player away, you might be able to see it. It's really just a stack of a ton of bullets here. Let's stop the client here. I'm gonna stop this real quick. I'm gonna turn off my spawners and try it again. So here, I'll stop the spawners, hit play. And I'm gonna make, oh, and I wanted to make the other one the host, but let, let's do it this way again. So I'll make this the host, we'll join in as the client. I just wanna show that one more time. Ah, oh, I didn't get all my spawners off. Oh, I turned them all on, whoops. I did the exact opposite of what I wanted to do, I think there. All right, Um, what do I wanna do here? I'm trying to think. I wanna make it so those bullets fly out in the right direction. So let's let's go through the process of fixing that. The reason that they're not flying out, actually, I wanna show it first. I wanna show that they're not flying out and why they're not flying out. So let me do a build real quick. I'll make the uh, the little one the server, and then we'll make our Unity client the, 
the client instead. So that way we can see what's actually happening there before we fix it. Because I think that understanding what we're fixing makes a lot more sense than just fixing it. So we'll hit play, we'll go in, we'll make this the host plus client. And I'm, I'm in here, I've got my guy spawning and I got this other player here. And let's take a look at what's going on here. So here you see that my bullets, oh geez, they're not even spawning here really. They're just kind of like, they're acting very weird. Let's go take a look at what's going on on these bullets. I wish these spawners were off. I thought I had turned them off. All right, so on our bullets, let's see, can I see them? Let's get down here. Uh, what I'm looking for is this stack of bullets that was just turned on and spawned somewhere. There should be a whole bunch of them that are just like stacked up on top of each other. And I think they're, they're right around here. Yeah, right around this shoot point, I guess. Nope, these ones are actually coming out. Where are those bullets? Somewhere there's a bunch of bullets that are stacked up. I give up on trying to show them because my spawners are messing with me. But the problem that I need to fix is really to make it so that the rigid body gets synchronized here. If we go look at our bullets, let's go to the prefab, go to the bullet object. Right now we have that network identity. And remember on the enemy, we did a network transform to synchronize the transform position and rotation. For the bullet, since what we're using is the velocity and we're just setting a velocity on it, what I want to use instead is the network rigid body. They use this and it's going to synchronize the velocity. You can see right here, there's a sync velocity option, which will just synchronize the velocity as it changes. So if I use that and I do another build and run, I expect to see that my bullets start working much closer to how they were before. So they just kind of go flying out. In fact, let's take a look at the bullet script real quick while I do a build. Is there anything in the bullet script that would move our object anything different? No, I don't see anything. Just wanted to double check there's nothing in here that's gonna fight with our movement um, against our rigid body that like we had with the player moving around. All right, so we've got an instance of our game here and we'll hit play. We'll start it up, we'll make this guy the, uh, oh, let's make this one the host. Then we'll make this one the client, run around and now I've got bullets um, somewhat, somewhat better it looks like. They're, they're starting to come out but they're acting a little bit strange still. And if I scroll down here, my guess is that they're never getting pulled, right? I'm just constantly, are they, are they ever getting reused? Oh no, some of them are getting reused. So some objects are getting reused, but you see that I'm getting a lot of bullets just spawning too. Let's, let's go over here so that all of my bullets are hitting the wall. Theoretically, if all of my bullets are shooting at the wall, I should never create any new ones. Let's see if that's happening. All right, it looks like, oh, wait, did it happen? Yeah, it looks like it. So we're not actually spawning any new bullets. That's good. Let's see if we move it down here again. Are our bullets firing out pretty smooth? No, something strange going on there. Let's see. Just doing a quick double check because there may be less to do here than I'm thinking I need to do. I can run around, I can shoot things, and I can kill everything. Get this okay let's stop playing and let's go through a couple more code changes that i know we need to make so let's see should the bullet be using a network behavior was one of the questions that's a good question i don't think it actually needs to so i was thinking perhaps it, maybe it would but i think if we're not using any of the actual script stuff from it then we don't actually need it to be a network behavior we're not using anything on it like our um is server or setting a command or a sync bar or anything but now that you say that, and I think about it, I remember that, oh yeah, we are setting our gun here. So if we do our set gun call, this should probably be done. Um, let me see, How do, what, what does our set gun do? Our set gun is used to determine our scoring. That's right, and for our pooling. So I wanna make sure that our set gun message gets sent over the network so that when we spawn a gun, it gets sent to all of the clients as well, I guess. It makes sense, right? We spawn it, run it. Let, let's, let's go double check. Actually, you know what, hold on. I'm thinking more on the on the gun. Ah, I lied. Okay, here's the problem. Yep, the server is not. I, I like. It. it looks like Bill just called it out. Thank you, Bill. Um, the server should be spawning these bullets right now. If I leave it like this, I could cheat. I could totally, totally cheat right here, accidentally or on purpose. Because right now my should check shoot should shoot check happens on the client. So. What I could do here, let, let's, let me replicate this really quick and show um, why server authentication or why server authoritative stuff is so important because I'm glad that I made this little mistake here because this, this is great. Let's do a file, build and run. And I'm gonna make the, the windowed one the, the server, right? I'm gonna make that our server and imagine that this is like 
you know, this is the real server. We're out on a real game. This is being run by people. There's a lot of people on it, right? So this is our server. We're, we're playing on it and we're playing with some people or whatever. And we host and we shoot at this speed. We're like a normal player. We're not a cheater, right? And then our buddy comes in and our buddy is a hacker. Our buddy says, hey, where's my player character? Let me go select it real quick. Let me uh, turn down my delay because I don't like shooting so slow like you. I don't want to be a noob. And then they run around and their fire rate is suddenly like this, right? And they're like, you're like, oh, wait, what happened? <laughs> Tell you a flag or something, right? This is why bullets need to be spawned and controlled by the server. You need to have one source of truth so that, hey, maybe the server is going to cheat. Sometimes the host is going to cheat. But if you have like a, a really dedicated server or a dedicated server, like an actual server process, then that's less of a problem. So let's see how we can change it so that it's spawned by the server and not cheatable. Very, very important thing. So glad I made that mistake. I'm glad Bill called it out too. Good stuff. All right. So what we need to do is make it make our bullets get spawned only on the server. So to do that, we got to go to our gun and we should only shoot or we should really only run our gun script on the server. So we'll add a little check here and say, if is server is equal to false return. That means that our gun needs to be a network behavior. So it replaced mono with network. Alt enter. Oh, we already have a using mirror statement up there. Perfect. And ah, I think we're good. How did I already have a using mirror statement up there? That's strange. Shouldn't have had that there. I must have added that accidentally. All right. So we've got our is server check here. And if it's not on the server, we'll return. So now only the server will fire bullet. The problem here, of course, let's see if I do a build and run is that I expect that I'm not going to see any bullets spawning um, out of the client. Let's try it out. So we do a build and run. And we play. Oh, and by the way, somebody's mentioning that on the client on the server, you didn't see that happening. It's true because we're not actually replicating those bullet messages out. So we're killing all of the things locally. They're blowing up and stuff, but it's totally desynchronized. So another good point too. All right, so let's host, join as a client. And um, now I've forgotten what I was, oh, my bullets. That's right, so I, I'm spawning my bullets. Bullets are spawning out on the server, but look at the client. I'm getting like random every now and then I get a bullet. Sometimes I get a bullet. There we go, oh, got another one. A Couple more are shooting out. I'm getting some weirdness on the client, right? The bullet is definitely not spawning the way that it's supposed to. So let's stop. Oh, that's weird. Why did all these enemies stop moving too? That was a little bit weird. I don't know what happened there. I'm going to stop playing though. And we're going to go back in and we're going to make it so that our bullets actually will get. So they spawn over the network already, right? Let's see. Let's go double check that. They do spawn over the network, but I want to assign them to a gun over the network as well. So we're going to go into our bullet script again. We're going to change this to be a network behavior. And then we're going to make the set gun method. Oh, I need to add a using statement. Alt enter and add a using statement for mirror. And I'm going to make this a command. So that our set gun method gets called on the on the server as well. So if we run it from, oh, actually, are we ever running this from the server or from the client? I don't think we are, are we? Let me think for just a moment. We run it. I uh, think thinking through this real quick. I don't think that I actually need to do that. Okay, well, let's see. What else do we need to do here? Uh, sorry, guys. I've just been blabbing so long, thinking out loud. I'm going to figure this out. Let's see. We're spawning the enemies. We're shooting the bullets. Let's see. Setting up that. I'm going to go through here real quick and just think for a second. So we're spawning them. I'm getting the bullets spawning out, shooting out. Why are they not hitting right? Let's, let's try. Let's, let me do one more build and run real quick and see what this is looking like. By the way, if anybody has any feedback, thoughts as we're going along, feel free to just type them in in chat. I'm going to take a look at it in a second. It's getting really warm in here. Ah. All right, did my build work? Oh, my build did not finish. What happened with my build? We had an error. Um. Oh, unsupported type gun. Oh, okay. So my gun here is calling set gun on it. Wait, what? Oh, because the gun can't. Okay, that's right. 
This this doesn't actually need to be called anyway. But the problem here, the reason that, that wasn't working is that the gun isn't set up. Uh, the gun isn't a thing that I can pass in as an ID. I would actually need to pass in the network identity of that object. In fact, here, let's let me show you what that would look like. So I'd change gun to network identity. And we'll call this network identity. And the reason for this is that we can't send just a random object through a command over a message. We can send a lot of things. I think there's a whole list of the serializable stuff that you can use. But to do just a random object, there's extra work that's involved. But we can just do a network identity, and I can do it like this. So I can say that the gun is equal to the, I believe it's network. Let's see. I cannot spell this. Okay, network identity dot game object dot get component of type gun. So that should get the gun from whatever network identity object is there. So that way I can pass over the network identity and still get the gun out of it. Now, if I do a build here, control shift B, I expect to see an error saying that I can't pass a gun in as a network identity, but I could just say, hey, get component network identity. Oh, well, nope, the bullet get component. I lied there. I wanna use the bullets now. No, I wanna use this thing's network identity. I lied, thinking out loud. Okay, so we wanna use our guns network identity and pass that in at, and then we on the other end we use that network identity and get the gun back from it all right that should work that should allow me to play now i'm gonna make sure that i can hit the play button and it all works all right hit play and host and i can run around okay good spawning and shooting just want to make sure that's working Oh, okay, here, let's fix this issue first. Before we go any deeper, we've got an exception right here when I hit something and it says that there's uh, no reference on the bullets on collision entry. So I'll double click on it and, oh, look right here. Oh, okay, it's actually that our gun isn't set. Okay, so our gun check, that gun set that I did there just did not work. That's interesting. So I must have screwed that up. Let's see what I did wrong. Okay, so look right here. The first call doesn't do anything. Okay, let's go look at this again. We call set gun on it and we set our object right here. I'm gonna add a breakpoint and debug it real quick and see what's going on. So I hit F5, add a breakpoint, jump into here, allow in debugging for this session, hit play. I may have to look back through my test stuff to see what I did different here. I think I messed something up, but we'll figure it out. So hit play and any second now it should start up. grab up my extra set of code just in case too, while that loads up. All right. Set up our host and we go blow things up. And why am I not getting the exception? Why am I not hitting my break? Oh, my command isn't getting called, I bet. If we go to set gun, I bet that this is never getting actually called. Let's see, why is not getting called? Add a breakpoint here, there we go. And we get our network identity. So bullet.set gun gets called and it's not actually. Let me see what I did on my other side real quick because I don't remember what I did here. Oh, I remember, I'm an idiot. Ha, okay. If the problem here is that, uh, I got it, I got it. So I, I, I'm doing this all wrong. I don't want to use a command. I want to use a client RPC. Sorry, if you're new to multiplayer development and uh, or you're like me and just, completely forgetful. Um, commands go to the server, client RPCs go to the client. When we're running from a server that's also the host and the client, it's gonna go from that server side of it over to the client side. So I wanna be sending a client RPC, not a command. Also, I don't necessarily need to use the network identity. I forgot, I can just use the game object and use game object. And then here I could just put in game object dot get component. Actually, let's call this gun object instead of game object, just because I don't want to accidentally reference my game object component. That is better. That's closer to how I should be doing it. And then we'll change this to just be the um, game object, just our game object of our gun. There we go. Let's try that one more time. This is the downside of not practicing multiple times before you do a live stream, right? All right, so let's try this out. Um, nope, won't be making one of those. All right, let's hit host server and we run around. Okay, let's see if I can kill, there we go. 
bad guy is dying now. All right, let's try building a multiplayer version again. So go back to build, build and run, get two clients in there and see if we should blow some stuff up. All right, so some people were asking about uh, dots, um, the data oriented tech stack. Uh, you could definitely use it to build a multiplayer game, but it's not where I would go right away. If you're not familiar enough with Unity building um, normal multiplayer games, I wouldn't dive into dots multiplayer right away. It's a bit harder, a bit more complicated, and um, you're probably not going to get any of the benefits out of it unless you're really pushing the boundaries anyway. And if you haven't already seen the boundaries and normal networking stuff, you're probably not going to know, you're not going to be anywhere near pushing those edges. So let's host. And let's join with a client and see if I can oh, move this player around, start blasting the bad guys. Looks like my bullets are now flying out pretty good on the client and the server. Let's go check out this one too. Okay, so over here, oh, what? Where am I not seeing my bullets? Wait, that's interesting. Okay, so over here, there's still something going on. On our client, it's not working. On the server, it's good. Our bullets fly out, and I think it's all, it looks like it's kind of perfect on the server, right? The client, however, is all kinds of messed up. The easiest way to debug this is to stop, stop, and then go back over here and make this little window into the um, the server itself and, and then make this one our client. So hit host. So that our one that's built or standalone where we can't see the code and can't see the objects is the server. And then we'll join it. And then see, it looks good over here and it's oh, is it buggy over here. Not yet. You see that it's going to start to get buggy over here. So we're shooting out bullets, we're shooting out bullets. This character seems to shoot out forever though. Notice that his bullets, because they're not getting pulled, never go away. If I move him up though, let's grab him and just move him up here. Eventually I expect to see his bullets. Yep, there we go. His bullets are no longer working on the client either. Let's go take a look. I'm gonna just scroll down here and go look at some of the objects here. So you see that no new bullets are getting spawned and none are getting turned on. So the issue here isn't super obvious if you haven't been through the code before. So let's go look at the gun and see how it works and see if we can figure it out. So in our get bullet call, or in our shoot really, we get a bullet by calling get bullet and we either spawn one, which remember when we were shooting straight off into nowhere, they kept spawning. So we instantiate it, we spawn it, we set a gun. That seemed to kind of work, right? But when we get it back from a pool, we check to here to see if there's something in a pool, we DQ it, we set it to active and then we launch it. This part is only getting called on the server. Right, so the part that sets our object to active doesn't get called on the client at all. So that's probably the thing that we need to fix, right? If I look over here at my notes, I believe that we're just setting it. How, how did I set that? I don't actually remember where I set that up to make it launch out. Let's see. I'm, uh, now I'm curious where I saved it before when I tested it out. So I oh, that's right. I just added a method to it. That makes sense. Let's do it that way. So when we shoot our bullet out, right now we set the bullets transform position, the rotation and the velocity right here in the gun. What we could do, one alternative way to do this, and I think it's a relatively clean way, it's the way I went with the first time, so it seems like a clean way, is to just make a launch method that does all of this on the bullet. Then I can send a client RPC so that all of the clients say, hey, here's my data, I'll go do this stuff, and then I'll synchronize later. So we'll take this little bit of code and I'm gonna change this into a bullet.launch. I'm gonna say, bullet.launch and I want to pass in, let's see, I need my shoot point here. I'm going to need my transform forward and my bullet speed. Maybe I could combine this into a velocity value and then use my shoot point as the first parameter. So I'll say, um, actually, you know, maybe I'll do, let's do a position and rotation and a, um, and a velocity instead of a transform. I think that makes more sense. That way I'm just passing over vectors instead of transform references. So say bullet.launch and we'll give it our, um, oh, actually I could even be grabbing these from the client. I'm not going to though, cause I want to pass them as parameters, but I could grab these from the client when I launch them too. So we'll say player, oops, copy this. I'm going to take this part right here, paste it in as the first parameter, copy the rotation, paste it in as the second parameter, and then copy this part and paste it in as the third parameter. Let's split those into separate lines here so that it's really, really obvious what we're doing. All right, so our launch method, it's gonna be on the bullet, it's gonna take the position, the rotation, and the velocity, and it's gonna set this data with that. So I'm gonna cut this code, just do shift delete, put it on my clipboard, get rid of these two lines here, and then we'll generate the launch method. So I'll hit alt enter and generate a method, F12 to go to it, 
and then paste in what I had. I'm going to replace internal with public just because a lot of people don't know what internal means. And then we'll get rid of the bullet keyword right there. And then I don't need position and, oh, actually, I don't need the player dot shoot point part. So I'm going to delete them both, but I'm going to hold alt, click here, drag down to the end of the dot so I can get them both and then just hit delete, make it simpler. And let's replace this code right here with this vector three, which should probably be named velocity. Let's rename it to velocity. Velocity, velo city. There we go. And then we'll paste that in. I need to add that client RPC attribute and save. All right, let's try that out. I think that that's going to make our bullets now launch properly on the client and the server, and we'll have an almost completely working networkable game. Let's try it out. Let's close that window, go back into Unity, stop playing, do a build and run one more time. And also, if everybody just hit like, subscribe, or whatever, real quick while we do a build and run, really appreciate it. Or just share the video, go drop it up on your Facebook or Instagram, or um, I don't, there's probably something newer now that I don't know about too. There's all kinds. Of <laughs> but yeah, you can drop it up there. I appreciate it. All right, let's try it out. So our 3D shooter is starting. Let's make, um, I'm gonna, I'll make this one the host this time. We'll join with our client. We'll run around, start shooting stuff. And let's see if, uh, if bullets start to dry up or if they work forever. Oh, here my bullets kind of looked like they were drying up. I think they were hitting somebody. Oh, okay, so it didn't work. Now the reason it didn't work is because I left out one little bit of code. So right now we're spawning it, we launch it at that position, but we're missing one final thing in the launch. So we shoot it, we get the bullet, we launch it, go in here, we get the velocity and all that, never actually turn the object back on. So our pooled objects, for the bullets, they get turned off. Let's go look at what that looks like real quick. So when a bullet gets hit or hits something, where is it? On collision, enter here. You see that we set the game object to deactive. When we go back into the pool, that's what we need to do. We just need to turn it back to active when we launch it. So I'm gonna copy this, paste it right up here. I'm gonna do it right here between when we set the velocity and set it to true. Doesn't actually matter where I put it, but I'm gonna put it right there. Now, if I do a build and run, my pooling issue should be fixed. My bullet should fire off and I should be able to kill all the enemies. Then we just need to synchronize up the enemies or the enemies' states and their, their health and their death and stuff. So let's do a file, build and run. And we'll start up. Yeah, there is, um, on those bullets, by the way, they do have a death timer of, I think, 10 seconds. After 10 seconds, they just reset themselves too. So eventually, we'd still see the pooling issue. It'd just take a little while because the bolts have to all kind of fly off on their own for a while. All right, so we host and we'll get in here as a client and we will connect. All right, so we're in as a host and a client and I'm in here shooting stuff. I just blast things with lots of bullets. I feel like the, the offset on my bullets is definitely a little bit weird. I probably should adjust that a little bit more, but it looks like it's working. Like the bullets seem to be flying off indefinitely, not having any problems. Um, synchronization looks good. Let's try it out here. I can move, I can blast enemies. Everything seems to be relatively solid. The only thing that's not completely synchronized and you can't really tell because my network latency is so bad is the enemy's death. It, that technically we could possibly maybe get things out of sync enough to, to disconnect our enemies so that they're not, being hit on both players, right? So that like one client thinks that they're hitting them and has killed the enemy, the, uh, the server may think something different, especially if there's just a lot of lag on that client. So we need to fix that up and make sure that the enemy's state is synchronized. And this is, I think probably one of the last big steps here. So stop playing and let's go back into our enemy code. So the current enemy script, let's see, find the enemy. It doesn't do a whole lot with the network behavior. In the update, we just check to see if we're not on the server. And if we're not on the server, we just don't do anything. Outside of that, we can take damage. So we take damage on the client and the server. And then we deal with collisions, but we actually don't do anything on collision. So when we take damage here, this is happening on the client and the server. And it really probably should only happen on the server, right? This isn't the kind of thing that we want our client to do. We don't want our client actually killing enemies, adding score and turning things off. So I want this to be a server only thing. So I'm gonna make this into a command instead. Instead of it being, well, should it be a command? Probably not. The bullets should only be doing the collision on the server. So we shouldn't even be sending a message to it. So what we're gonna do is make sure that this never runs on the client. So we'll say if 
is server equals false return. We should never take damage on there. Let's go into the bullet too. Because on the collision enter for the bullets, do we want to do anything? Do we want to take damage and kill the enemy? Probably not. We probably don't want to call this code at all, right? We don't want to actually be calling in to check it. Now, do we want to deactivate the thing and add it back to the pool if it hits something? Yeah, probably. I I'm kind of inclined to say that we do, even though the um the bullet may not have hit on the server and it may not be completely resynchronized. Actually, you know, let's just let's just bail out. So if in on collision enter, if we're not on the server, we'll return. So this will only run on the server. The bullet the bullets collision handling should only run on the server. I think that that makes sense for me. Now if we try it again, we do a build and run. What I expect to see is that the client is no longer able to kill things, or at least not in the same way, and that the server is. Let's let's see what happens though. Let's see how it actually works out. All right, we'll jump in here, start building. And there we go. We'll have our 3D shooter little window here be the host and hit play here, be of client. And then let's see if we can uh, see our enemies die and blow up. So I shoot at enemies, bullets go through them all on the client. Let's look at the server though. On the server, the, even the other player seems to be killing them. So look, our other player right there, I'm pointing at my screen here, but the other player there is able to kill on both but over here on the client, nothing actually dies because all of our death is handled on the client. So we need to change it so that death of NPCs or enemies is handled on the server. To do that, we'll go into our enemy script. And then when the enemy dies, we really just want to replicate out that death, right? So when our guy dies, let's go into the enemy script, like I said, and not just say that we're going into it. But when this guy dies, we want to say, hey, he's dead. Um, kill him on the server and all of the client. So let's go through that process real quick. To kill an enemy, we just need to go through our check right here where we spawn them. And when we spawn the prefab, I said spawn, what am I talking about? To kill an enemy, they take damage. We hit them at an impact point. We give a player number so we can award some points and a damage amount. We decrement their health by that amount, get rid of that extra space. And then we spawn a hit prefab whenever the thing gets hit. So this is that little impact particle. First step, let's spawn that particle over the network. So we'll say var hit instance equals our instantiate. This is gonna give us back the game object that we're spawning here. I believe hit prefab is just a game object. Yep. In fact, let's call that out, game object, and make it really explicit because we're gonna say network server dot spawn right after. And we're gonna spawn that hit instance right there. And because it's a game object, we can just pass that in. So now we'll spawn the prefab whenever we take a hit on the object or whenever the, guy, the enemy takes a hit there. The next thing we wanna do, well, let's see. We want to play the source on there. Um, so here's the thing. If we spawn these prefabs over the network and then we play the audio source, we're going to be sending one message for that, one message for that, and probably another message for exploding it. Um, so let's just change this up to say take hit and take hit will do an audio source and spawn the prefab locally. And then we'll do another one that spawns this thing as a separate message. So I'm going to change this a tiny bit. I'm going to actually delete that delete out my spawning. I'm going to take this chunk of code right here, hit alt enter and extract it to a method. And let's call this take hit on client or on client. And we'll pass in that impact point. We'll make this a client RPC. There we go. And that should work, right? That's now going to just send the message out so that we will spawn the thing and play the audio source in both cases. I think that's better. Now we'll do the same for destroying the enemy. So Instead of uh, calling it take hit, let's just call it die on client. So I'll take this little chunk of code, alt enter, extract method, die on client. I like this much better than spawning the prefabs or spawning the particle systems over the network. We'll copy our client RPC, paste that in there. I'm going to get rid of these two private keywords because I don't need them and save it off. Everything here, I think, should work. I mean, the score system stuff's not going to work perfect because our score is not set up yet for networking, but everything else I think is going to. Work. So what's going to happen? Well, we'll take damage. We'll call take hit on client, which sends that client RPC, the remote procedure or remote. What's the P stand for? I've lost it. Something call. Um, how did I lose that word? And then we'll call die on client on there if the player, if the enemy should die. Let's try it out. All right, we'll go back in. We'll hit file, build and run one more time.
and see how this works. All right, so lots of chat about building MMOs. By the way, building MMOs, a lot more than just building network code. There's network stuff there. Um, that's a big chunk of it, but there's a lot of other stuff that comes into building an MMO. The, the network part is huge. It's like a full game worth of development on its own, but then there are like five other games worth of development that you got to do building an MMO. A lot of stuff involved. Um, all right, so we connect. We'll connect again, and let's shoot some enemies. I see them sparking. I see them blowing up. I think everything is actually synchronized. Let's check it out. Blow up some more bad guys. Looks like it's kind of working. Yep, I can blow them all up. Everything is synced, and uh, the deaths are synced too. My player just kind of ran off the screen. Let's see what's going on with the scores too. So I look at my scores. I got 14,500, 14,500. I think I just end up with um, player one's score right now. Or it might actually be I'm getting the combined score. That's right. That makes sense. Because I'm getting the score for both of the players. All right. So blast this guy. Yeah. All right. So let's stop playing. Take a break for just a second. And talk about uh, what we're going to do next. Oh. Yeah. Well, building your own network layer is... Uh, it's not, not a realistic thing for 99% of developers or 99% of teams. Some people are going to build their own stuff and it makes sense. There are definitely cases when you need to build your own stuff. Most games don't need it. Most games work fine with uh, built-in networking systems with a little bit of tweaking and tuning. But if you want to build like crazy stuff, you want to push the boundaries, you may have to actually build your own stuff. When you're building out an MMO, you're probably going to have to build out your own stuff. You build out like a, a giant game, you, even like something like... um a battle royale game you're gonna have to work heavily on the networking stuff and and really use it somewhat custom system you're not gonna be able to just slap in mirror and have it work magically right you're gonna need something more complicated but you don't want to start there don't start by trying to build out your network system build a game and then if the game is fun and it makes sense then get the networking good and perfect it a lot of people will spend a lot of time just building out systems and never build a game and then it's it's demotivating kind of demoralizing and and i i just i don't prefer it I, i'd recommend build the game first um get it working get it kind of good and if you need to adjust the networking you need to make it better you can always tweak it tune it and replace it later and you'll have more experience you'll get better at it don't don't dive in and just expect that your game is like don't try to build a game that's going to scale to thousands of players right away on day one as, especially not as your first thing it should be you know like your third or fourth game where, you, where you're getting up to these crazy scales of stuff Okay, um, so let's see. What should we do next? We have a couple options. There's a bomb that's set up. I don't know if I showed it, but if you hadn't seen the previous streams, there's actually a bomb that we can drop that little red thing that's out there blinking. Let's hit post and watch. If I hit the button right there, I can drop out more of them. And they actually, well, they, they explode and blow up enemies if they end up near them. Let's see if that one does it. Gonna hit anybody? Oh, it's gonna be too far from everybody. But ideally, the bombs should end up near bad guys and then blow them up. There we go. You saw those two guys blow up, right? Actually, uh, that probably requires a little bit of skill to line the enemies up and get them to push the bomb around or sit on it, right? So maybe I'll set that up next. You guys have any preferences or recommendations over something other than the bomb? Or should we just make the bomb networked and then, uh, oh, just stack up and watch that death. Boom. Okay. Yeah, I think I want to do the bomb, but what do you guys want to do after the bomb? Should we do score system or do you guys have some other recommendation or idea or maybe like player color changes or something else? So I'll set up the bomb. And then um, while we're going through that process, if you have ideas for the next thing you want to see, put them in chat and we'll figure out what the next one we're going to pop in there is. So oh, look at that the bomb is really cool. It just blows up all the bad guys. So we'll go into our project view. Let's go take a look at the bomb script now, because this is one of the few things that's not networked. Our bomb isn't networked, and we also have a bomb dropper script that's not networked. I'm gonna actually look at the bomb dropper first, and then we'll look at the bomb script itself, because they're both relatively simple. The bomb dropper has a bomb prefab that we reference, a delay for how often I can fire it, and of a release velocity for how fast it fires out when it just kind of rolls forward. Um, it references its player for, I believe, adding score, and then a next drop time for when we can use it again. Has a should drop bomb, which just checks to see if we can drop it. So if our time is greater than the next time and we press the button for our player. So we press bomb one, which is just set up right now. I believe that's circle here set up on in the input settings. And then we drop a bomb by setting our bomb time. 
spawning the bomb using just a standard instantiate call and setting our player setting getting our rigid body and then setting the velocity to our forward times that release velocity we can launch out at a speed let's go look at it real quick we'll go look at our player here in the prefabs it's got the bomb dropper script on it got this bomb dropper component right there and you see i've got a delay of five and a release velocity of 10 so it goes out at 10 meters a second rolling forward stops pretty quick but you get the idea so we want to make this bomb dropper drop bombs over the network. First step of spawning an object over the network is go to network manager. And remember, we need to assign it as a prefab, but it also has to have a network identity. So I guess this is the second step. Sorry, everybody. I lied to you again. So if I try to take that in there, then work. Go to step one. First step was actually add a network identity. And then I'm going to add a uh, I'm going to add a network transform too, because I'm already here. Let's speed that up and just add the transform as well. We'll leave those both on there. And then I'll go to my network manager and assign the bomb from my prefabs folder. Make sure I don't get the one that's in my scene. All right, save that off. Go back into our code. And what do we want to do? Well, I guess we just want to do a network spawn of our bomb, right? So when we create the bomb, add another line here. I'll say network server dot spawn and pass in bomb dot game object. This is the thing again that makes it replicate over the network so that the object gets replicated to all of the clients. So hit Alt Enter and add the using mirror statement up to the top and the error should go away. A bomb should now spawn on the clients as well as the server. Um, I'm gonna go to the set player method though because this is a method that's gonna need to get called over the network and well, we're gonna need to add in a client RPC just like we did before. So go here and add the client RPC attribute and hit Alt Enter and add the using statement. But I also need to change my bomb into a network behavior, start using these client RPCs. And um, yeah, I think that's about it, right? So we'll add network behavior or replace mono behavior with network behavior so we can use the client RPC. Actually, I'm not 100% sure if you can use client RPC outside of it. I assume you can't, but I haven't actually tried it. All right, so this should allow me to pass in the player number and that should be cacheable or serializable. An integer or a number or a string text numbers, all those kinds of things tend to be serializable and work just fine in here. Same with like vectors, like in the previous section where we passed in the, what is it? The velocity, the direction, the velocity and the rotation. Um, why did I do velocity and rotation? I don't remember. Okay. So, let, oh, actually I do remember, but it doesn't matter. All right. So now we're spawning a bomb over the network and it, I think it should work. Let's double check that our bomb has a network identity. Yep. Let's try doing a build and run and see if we can spawn the bombs and have them roll out over the network. And if anything else weird happens. Oh, you know what I just thought about too? In our bomb dropper script, our should drop bomb should only be true if we're on the server. Our bombs shouldn't be, well, wait, no, that's not true, huh? Oh, let's go through it. Let's try. I, I was sitting here thinking out loud while I'm uh, waiting for a build and I'm, I think I'm thinking through the wrong thing. So here we'll start up our server. We've got our server there. We'll start up our client and here I'll run around and drop a bomb. And oh, I got a bomb on both, right? So here I'm shooting it, but I'm dropping out two bombs. Let's try it again. So I drop out two bombs. Let's look here. Do I see the two bombs? I don't even think I see them. So here I'm going to drop out a bomb on the client or this is the server, right? The other one was the client. That's the problem. Okay, I see. So here's the server. I drop out a bomb and I see it on both. And then if I move the client up here, I drop out a bomb and I see bombs from both players, but the bombs aren't going over the network, right? So it's spawning out there on the client. It's spawning for both players, but it's not going over the network. And on the server too, notice that it spawns for both players. I got two bombs every time I hit it. So let's fix the spawning for both players and then let's make it work over the network, right? So stop playing. It shouldn't spawn for both players by, well, just adding in a check in our bomb dropper to not check if we're on the server though, but to check if we're the local client authority, right? So we want to say if is local, what is it? Let me, let me oh, this my bomb dropper needs to be a network behavior. Change that. And then we'll say is local player. So if we're the local player, then we should be able to drop bombs. If we're, if this is a player that's like somebody else's player, and again, local player means like, this is the player for the client that's connected. So for the first one, the host, it's going to be that the first player that's in there. For the second one, it's going to be true for only that second player, the one that you're controlling. So is if it's not the local player, so if is local player is false, we'll just return out of update. We don't want to do 
anything with our bomb dropping for the, the other player. We only want to do it for our own player. That should fix a lot of the issues already. So do a build and run. I expect to see that at least we're not getting two bombs launching out. Anymore. So let's hit play. And we'll host right here and join as a client. All right, so run around, drop a bomb. I see only one bomb flew out. Let's see, I'm gonna drop another bomb on the, on the client here. If it only, only one bomb flies out. Do I get a bomb here though? I didn't see anything. Let's try dropping a bomb here. So on the server, I drop a bomb and I see it roll out for both, right? Let's try it one more time. There we go, I see it roll out for both. This is the server. And then this is the client. Let's move it, where's my client player again? Let's drop a bomb that rolls down this way. I don't see anything. Let's try it again. I've got it just off the screen there. Drop another bomb like that. So it's not replicating from the client to the server. The reason for that is that the server is the only thing that can really spawn these objects. The client can't just go spawning objects over the network. It can't do a network spawn. To do that, that's well, that's where these commands come in. So remember earlier, if you were watching earlier, I accidentally used a command when I wanted to use a client RPC. When I wanted to send something up to the client from the server. Commands are used for sending things from the client to the server, and that's what we want to do here. So when we want to drop a bomb now on the server, or on the, yeah, really on the server from a client, we can't just call drop bomb and spawn it and do a network instantiate. Instead, what we want to do is to say when we should drop the bomb. So when the timer is met and they've pressed the button, then let's just call a command on the server to try to call to try to drop the bomb. So to do that, we'll go in here and we'll say, hey command this is now a command and we'll set our next drop well this will almost work i, I want to explain why this isn't work because i feel like i'm about to miss it here so this would almost work just doing this we would say hey should we drop a bomb on the client so imagine i'm the client and i've met my timer and i press the button right i send the message up to the server the server says hey the next drop time is this and um does the bomb dropping and all that I'm the client again, right? Next frame, I hit the button again and I send the message again because, hey, look, the next drop time never got set, right? So next drop time doesn't get set on the client right here. And I'll be able to spam out this message as much as I want. I'm not doing any server side checks to see if the thing should fire off. Let's try that out. I wanna see, show you what this looks like because this is a very common networking mistake or bug that happens where we're giving a little bit too much authority to the client. So we'll do a build and run. And we're going to spawn out a bunch of bombs and uh, I'll see how fast I can spam out bombs on the client, ignoring the rule, but the server will be completely following the rule because it's setting its value itself. So try it out. I'm going to make my Unity instance the client so we can go into debug mode and see what these variables are looking like. All right, so here we go. We've got a host and I'm going to hit play. We'll join as a client. Oops, I might have double clicked there. Hopefully that worked. Okay, good. Join in as a client. And then I'm going to hit the bomb button and look at that. I can just keep firing out bombs, just spamming them off. Oh, actually, now that I lied about it, because the server actually allows it too, because the server isn't doing any checks either to see if we shouldn't be able to do bombs. If I try to spawn a bomb on the server, though, it's fine, because it's actually setting its value. And let me show you real quick again what the problem is, because I, I explained it, but I think that showing the code here or the variable here makes more sense too. So let's we'll go a little bit deeper. We'll select the player here and I go to debug mode here, switch over to debug mode in the inspector. And if we look at the, where is it at? The bomb dropper script, look at the next drop time. It's always zero. No matter what I do, no matter how many bombs I fire off, it never gets set. So we need to just fix that up and make it so that it's server authoritative instead of client authoritative. The two different things that we want to do. First is it. We want to make sure that the client doesn't keep sending messages if it doesn't think that it should be able to drop a bomb. So the client should keep track of its next drop time as well. But we also want to make sure that we do some checks on the server so that if the client does decide to cheat, it can't. So let's do the checks on the server first and then we'll do the client side checks second. Client side checks are really just a performance improvement or the server side checks are a cheat improvement. So when we do the drop bomb, we'll just say, hey, if, uh, time dot time is greater than or equal to next drop time or actually let's say if it's less than then we'll just return we just won't do a drop bomb so we'll just double check the time on the server that should be enough to prevent us from 
cheating on the client, um, but it's still gonna allow us to spam out messages. Let's try it out. So we'll go back into Unity, do a build and run. And we'll start hosting. All right, so here we are, we're in. I should be able to drop bombs on the server. There we go. And then we'll join on the client real quick and just start spamming out bombs. So I'm hitting it as fast as I can and they still don't spawn out any faster. Let's see, they spawn out at the normal rate. But I am still sending up that message because my client doesn't do any checks. So every time I hit the button, I try to send it or try to spam that out. Now, if I wanted to add client side checks to it to prevent that, I can just go back into our code right here. And then what we could do is say, hey, when we do the drop bomb message or when we send the drop bomb message, add another line right here to also set our next drop time on the client. So we just copy this line of code right here and paste it in so that it gets set on the client and on the server. Oh, I accidentally killed my braces there. So that would be enough to prevent the messages from going overboard and just uh, getting spammed out every time the player hits it. So that the player will only send the message when the client actually thinks that they should drop the bomb and then the server will get the message and double check that, hey, they actually should be able to drop it. Let's see, I don't know if there was much else I wanted to get into here. I think we've got quite a few different systems and really my goal here is just to make sure that to show people how to build out a, a relatively simple multiplayer game where you can take a single or a, a simple like offline game where you've got two, con two sets of controllers and you'd be able to just build it out and run it over the network and play it online. Now, when you want to play, if you want to use this one online, this specific one, I think the only downside right now is that this, if I remember right, this KCP transport doesn't work on WebGL build. So if you wanted to do a, I was going to do a WebGL build with it, but I would have had to change that and I kind of ran out of time. But if you want to um, just use this and do a build, you can definitely just create your own game and you know, launch and connect over the network. There's a couple of little things that you need to do though. So one of the important parts, well, here, you know, let's let's commit this to collaborate, and I'm gonna um, sync it on my laptop and connect from another system real quick to show what that looks like and what that process is, because it's something that uh, there's no building a multiplayer game is fun and all, but if you don't connect over the network, what the hell is the point, right? If you're just playing a window in a window, you may as well just have a, a local multiplayer game. So let's say that we um, added multiplayer. I'm gonna check them all and publish. Oh no. Um, I have an issue because I, I pre-synchronized all this stuff. So I'm not going to be able to do this. I can uh, collaborate. Hmm. How can I fix this up? I think if I sync it, it's going to... Let's hit it. We'll hit sync and I'll just do the merge and I will accept my stuff, I hope. Either that or I'll override it. And it's fine because the code is pretty close to exactly where, where we're at now, I think. So let's go through it though. So what we'll do is we'll set it up. I'll start playing here and then I'll start playing on the, uh, there we go, yep. So we'll take, if you haven't used Collaborate by the way, source control system built into Unity. It's not the most powerful one. I still prefer Git, but out of all the source control systems, it's probably my number two now because it's built in, it's easy to use. And for solo simple projects, it's really, really simple and just quick to go with. So I would recommend it for anybody who hasn't used Collaborate before, at least try it out. So I'm going to hit use my changes for all of these. And the reason that I'm having that, by the way, is just that I'd already pre-committed some other stuff where I'd gone through and tested it out and I, I would, had to revert back and then redo this stuff again and then recommit it. So I want to make sure that it's all synced up. All right, so now I've got that committed and collaborate on there. I'm going to go over to my laptop, which is just right down here, and then we'll just sync it up. So I'll go over to my history. And it says that um, I made a change nine seconds ago. So I'll hit update. I'll pull that in and then we'll do a quick hosting. And I'm going to run around with this controller now, not this one. It's actually hooked up to my laptop and see the game running over the actual network. So to get it going over the network while that one's synchronizing, I'm going to hit play and show you um, something somewhat important here. Notice this part right here that says client local host. Ah, it's really, really, really tiny. This part right here. I need to change this so that it's running over the network instead. If you just set it as localhost here, if I stop playing and go select the network manager, you'll see it. If I set it as localhost, it's not gonna use the, um, 
the IP address bound to the network card. So when you have a network card, it's got one IP address. Usually it's got one IPv4 address and be like 192.168.something.something. Dot dot something. It's usually one dot something, but it depends on your network. So what you need to do is make sure that that IP address is available to connect with. If you just have localhost in there, only local connections can work and you can't connect over IP. So you have two options there. You could either figure out what your IP address is by just typing, um, you can open up a command window, run CMD, pull this up and you can type in IP config and then you'll be able to see your IP address. Right here you can see this is mine right now. Just switched over router, so mine's a dot two instead of one because I haven't taken down the other router yet. So I've got that there. I could put that in, but I could also just go right here and put in 0, .0, .0, .0. .0. That'll usually, I'm pretty sure it works the same in mirror as it does with UNet, but that should make it bind to all IP addresses here. Now, there's still another step because connecting over the network also requires the firewall ports to be open. So you need to make sure that you open up the port that you're connecting on, which right here is 7777 through your firewall. Or if you're just testing it out and you feel safe with it, you could disable your firewall for a minute, turn it back on. But generally you wanna figure out how to do the port opening and then you're gonna to need to do some port forwarding. Those are things that depends a little bit on your router and your, your network setup in Windows. You just open up the Windows Advanced Firewall, add in a port or port setting and or firewall setting and firewall rule to allow it for, I believe it's, you need a UDP and TCP, but I'm not completely sure on this one. Um, I have them both though, just enabled for the, for the port. So we'll hit, um, what do I wanna do? I wanna hit play and see the number show up there. It should be just zeros again, instead of the local host. And then I'm gonna go over to my server or my laptop, go to game view mode. I'm gonna hit play. And assuming that my server, my game starts up, I'm gonna try to connect. Okay, so here I'm gonna hit host and just connect over here from my client. I'll put in my IP address, which is that 192.168.2.7. Let me, let me go back into, open up that command window again. Yeah, it was dot seven. So it's IP config at the command line. So dot seven, I almost put a dot six there. And we will hit client and connect and look at that. It actually connected. So I could, I saw it all appear on there, but I'll show you on the other, uh, the other direction too. Let's get these controllers back on and see if I can move around. There we go. I got one player moving around and let's see if the other player will move. There we go. Both players are moving around over the network now. So now they're both just literally moving yeah, over my, my local network. So I'm gonna stop the host and I'm gonna switch it over so that the other one is the host real quick, just so you can see. That actually disconnected the other one instantly. So I'll make the laptop the host. And then I will try to connect to it. So this was, let's go to maximize on play, play, play. I'll change this to 192.168.2.6 because this is the IP of the other device. Hit connect and it won't work. The reason it won't work is because I haven't opened up any of the firewall stuff on here. Your server needs to be the one with the firewall ports opened up. If you don't do that, you're not gonna be able to connect. And again, I would recommend testing with the example scenes before you test with your own stuff. If you wanna do a network test, don't do it in your own code, don't do it in your own project, because if you made a mistake there, you might be mixing it up. And it's hard to know whether or not it's a network issue or something in your stuff. You wanna make sure that you're debugging the right thing. So do it in the example stuff first, get that working over the network, and then switch over to doing your game stuff in the network. All right, I'm gonna stop playing over the network. And I think I'm just gonna take a little break here and just take some questions, see what people want to know about, um, if there's anything else, and then maybe we'll code a little bit more. Maybe we'll just do a little bit of Q and A and stuff after, I, I don't know. So um, anybody got any just networking general questions and stuff? Oh, there definitely is gonna be, so it, the way that it's set up right now, there's not any prediction, there's not any, um, smoothing of the networking or anything. So it's not gonna be very good. The, the, the current network setup needs a lot of work to get better, um, but it's just kind of up and running so we can move around, right? And also my laptop is overloaded right now, so it, it's not, not running very well. It's doing a bunch of other stuff at the same time. Okay, let's see, any kind of questions? Mirror for a Super Smash Bros type game. Uh, I don't know. I would assume so if you set it up right. I mean, a lot of the things that you need to do so when you get into really fast competitive games where you, where you need to have things that are super well-timed and stuff, you're gonna be sending a lot less network state and network synchronization. You won't be using things like network transforms that send the position and rotation constantly. Instead, you'll wanna synchronize usually on input and you wanna have like a 
a simulation that matches everywhere, no matter. So you could replay that same exact input and have the exact same gameplay constantly. If you see a lot of those games like that, that have replay systems and there a lot of the time, that's how they work where they're not really storing off like all of the action and the movement. They're storing off all of the input and then replaying that type of stuff. I don't know if smash bros does it that way. I'm not sure how they do it, but uh, you would probably, you need to come up with something to make it nice and quick and, and a system for it. But you could, I don't see why you couldn't build something like that using mirror unless there's some other technical issue with it that i don't know about but i don't i don't think there's anything um anything in there that would prevent it really let's see will you create a stream creating a moba style lobby based on mirror um i don't know if i'll create a lobby for moba stuff or not I, it just didn't seem like that kind of thing that a lot of people would be very interested in but maybe uh when you put the command on top of the drop bomb function it made that function run from the server yes that's a great, that was a good question. So if we jump over here, the command in the bomb dropper script right here. So when I added the word command here, that literally made it so that this call right here now doesn't just call this method. It sends a message, calls the method on the server, which is kind of magic. You know, I'm very used to like the, or at least I was very used to the old school ways of having to build up a message, package up that message, send the message, read the message, and then deal with it. Now with the way that mirror set up and the way that it does the weaving, you just put the command attribute there and it's really just doing all of that for you. It's wrapping up all of the, the tedious stuff that it is easy to mess up over and over for you. So you don't have to do it. All right, let's go to some more questions. I just got here, but are you using ECS? No, I'm not. Um, ECS is cool, but I, I'm not using it for this right now. I don't think that it's what I would recommend for people getting started with networking. I'd say that if you're building a network game that you can't do without ECS or dots, then um, I'd jump over to that. But uh, it's not where I would start with building network games for sure. And it's definitely not what I would recommend people build their first network game with because you got to learn dots and ECS. Or I mean, dots and networking and dots is constantly changing. Not uh, This mirror system is super stable, super simple. You can really just think about the logic and not so much the networking. With the other systems, you really need to be thinking about the networking. And that's great once you're at that point and you're you know at the point of needing to optimize your network. But when you're starting out, having to think through how that networking works and not just being able to deal with the logic, I think is um, it, it'll slow you down a lot and probably not for a lot of benefit, again, unless you really have a use case for, for super high-end stuff. Did you do any client-side prediction? Um, no, not yet. That's not something that we've added. Um, and I may just do another video on how to do um, client side network prediction because it's a, a little bit more complicated, but not that much. And probably do like a good like step by step tutorial on that. Let's see anything else. Um, is there an asset? Oh yeah, there is an asset. That's true. The um, so on the topic of dots, uh, the guys that made Mirror, they they I saw they do have an asset for dots. I haven't actually looked at it though, so. Maybe it's just as easy in dots as it is outside of dots, but it's still, I wouldn't recommend if you haven't built a network game before and you're not already using dots, I wouldn't use it as your, your first starting point. I'd say use that when you're at the point where you need the performance. Um, or if you're already using dots for stuff, if you're already using that in your project, then Hey, that makes sense. But I wouldn't make the jump just for that. Let's see. Um, Okay, they're talking about connections, network connections, photon versus mirror. Um, I don't have any real strong preference. I have a lot of friends who recommend mirror over photon. Again, I haven't used it in a production environment yet. I haven't had a need for it. We've all use, always used custom stuff, but um, or, or photon long before mirror existed. But I think that m it, when people ask me, I would say I would probably look at both, but look at mirror, um, especially around the cost side. And I think that there may be some performance benefits, but to be honest, I don't know. I don't know if um, Photon has any performance hits any, in Unity anymore or not. It's been way too long. The biggest issue that I had with it, though, was more just on the, the cost and pricing model there. With Mirror, I, you know, as long as you're hosting your stuff, it's free. With Photon, the licensing was somewhat expensive, so it's a little bit harder to get started with if you're brand new. Oh, I guess they probably have a, they think they have a free tier that's not too hard to get started with and probably really easy to get going with, too. So I don't know. It just depends on uh, which one you want to use, but I, I don't think there's any strong reason to use one over the other outside of cost, but I could be wrong. Uh, what did you guys use for Unity MMO stuff? Um, a, a mix of things, a variety of things. Uh, initial super early prototyping just with Photon, but 
obviously not for real stuff. Um, switched over to a couple of different network libraries, um, used Ulink for a while and now custom stuff. Um, and it just depends. Um, a lot of games, I would say that almost every MMO that I've ever seen has some custom, they're going to have some custom networking stuff because I mean, MMOs are just a weird problem where you have an unknown number of players doing an unknown number of things that as you control it, you're adding constraints to the game that start to piss people off. So the more and more you limit it, the more you anger people. So you have to figure out how to allow as much as possible without, um, you know, killing stuff <laughs> without making the game unplayable. So it's, uh, it's always very custom stuff in there. It's interesting. I was thinking through, um, talking to a friend not too long ago about one of the old, Oh, I don't know if I should talk about that. <laughs> so, so some of the old game code and some of the old network code that, that we had and some of the old stuff. And um, I, I, the the code there gets so, I, would, I wouldn't say it's confusing. It gets a bit confusing and complicated and scary to touch. So we had code in one of these projects that was released and live for a very long time that nobody even realized had a bunch of debugging stuff just inside the code that was slowing it down. And I think that it had code in there. It had said, it had notes in there saying, hey, make sure you delete this. The stuff is for debugging and it's a performance hit. Um, make sure we delete it before release. And of course, as always, it's a comment in there by somebody who either forgot about the comment or left the team or left the company or did whatever and isn't there anymore. And then other people go look at the code and they go, I don't want to touch the networking and break the entire game. I don't know what the side effect of changing this is or deleting it. I don't know if this comment is even true. So it just stays in there and it stayed in there for years until uh, way, way, way later, somebody's trying to debug something, found a, a found this bit of code and just went for it, fixed it. it was, I think it was Todd that fixed it, which doesn't surprise me. He was a badass programmer. He'd always find it was really good, right? So he, he, I think he was the one that ended up fixing it. I, like, I heard about it. I was like, yeah, it's not a surprise. Well, one of the many, many reasons that I hate um, commenting stuff in code for like things to do later just do it right then don't don't leave it um yeah it's it's scary stuff stuff like that happens all the time and then literally over the life of a project just killing performance probably cost who knows how much in in network bandwidth alone and and cpu time and stuff tons tons of cost (laughs) anyway uh let's go into more questions um do you be doing more mirror tutorials um, I think so. I think I'll probably do a couple more um, just network game tutorials where I go over maybe like a couple different like mini games like start to scratch um, and maybe I'll do it down in an edited version where I can show you exactly all of the steps involved without any of the debugging stuff as well to go through like a couple different little multiplayer games. And by the way, I, this game right now, I have only connected two players. There's literally no thing stopping me from connecting five players, 10 players. I think I put four in there because I was planning on just connecting four, but nothing that can stop me from connecting any number of players. I don't think I have a max number set. I wonder if that's the setting on the network manager now. Let's go check, check, take a quick peek. Max connections four. Okay, I lied. I set it to four players by default, but I could turn that up and just connect any number of players and run them around. All right, let's see what else we got for questions here. Um, do I get a return? My dedicated object slash tag. I'm not sure what that means. Um, let's see. I'm just reading through here. So, oh, slash slash notes slow down the game. Not, I mean, obviously comments don't slow. It was not, so when I said, it wasn't the comment that slowed down the game. It was the code right after the comment that said, hey, delete this stuff before we go live instead of actually deleting the stuff before going live. Um, that That was the problem. It was the, replacing the action with just replacing a comment with a, hey, let's go do this later that nobody ever does because when you put a comment in there like that, people get scared. If they're not the person that did it and they don't know and can't ask the person, they're going to be very terrified to go in and change the networking code of a live network game, especially low level stuff that says it's been there for years and says, hey, it's a debug thing. (laughs) Okay, so um, some people want to see the debugging stuff. That's good stuff. Is this something like in your beginner course? Um, it, the networking side is not. No, it's much more. The beginner course is more focused around understanding what all of the code means, how the code works, um, things like abstractions, interfaces, um, 
and just a lot of 2D development as well. It's a lot about um, 2D stuff and really focused on the coding side, not n nothing on networking at all. Um, I'm thinking about adding a networking component to the architecture course. So I'm going to send out a, an email sometime really soon to find out exactly what people are most interested in. So that may end up being a part of that, um, but I don't know. Uh, it, networking stuff isn't in there though. It's it's primarily just um, it's all code. It's programming, 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 learning how to do the code and how to interact with all of the different systems, uh, use source control and that kind of stuff, and then testing the knowledge against that. Okay, so changing the networking code of a live game is one of those yeah, what could go wrong situation. Totally. Like apparently nothing went wrong, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, he fixed it and it, it worked out. But uh, yeah. It's, terrifying right they're just like looking in there like oh yeah we could just delete out this bit of code in here and see what happens uh -huh. let's see um any other questions in here um did you pick up many assets in the asset store sale i didn't get much really um this last couple of days i i got a bunch of stuff last week and the week before so i've been um kind of burned out and it's not really that there weren't things to get it's just that i have a bunch of things that i still haven't had a chance to go try out yet. So I, I've been trying not to get too much down the rabbit hole of digging in and looking, but I probably will end up looking more this weekend too and just see what other kinds of cool stuff in, is in there. For the asset store, by the way, anybody's curious, like I love grabbing art packs off of there. I grab all kinds of art constantly to pull into to demos and games and to like inspire me for stuff. But then I also like to grab code packages too and just look at them, see how they work, what they're doing in there and pick up some cool tricks and techniques and stuff. So I, I find that to be fun. Okay, um, I guess we need to move somebody real quick from chat. But he's got some problems <laughs> and we'll continue on. All right, cool. Anybody got any uh, other questions? Let's see. Would you try a 2D multiplayer game in the future for now? Oh, that could be interesting. Maybe that Smash Bros idea would be um, a good way to go, like a 2D um, fighter or something as a as a game there for multiplayer networking because then we could go through the the performance side of it um how, how to get that quick enough but there's also not a lot of mechanics that we have to deal with we just get two players bouncing around punching each other or shooting stuff at each other or something yeah that could be a fun one and, and something i think that it could be um done relatively quick and there's not a lot of extra code involved to just be around the, the networking stuff i like that idea so I'm, I'm gonna um write that down and consider it heavily See, I used to be working on an online project bouncing bullets. How do you handle dozens of physics objects over the network like Fall Guys does? Um, well, a lot of it ideally is having, I, I'm not sure how Fall Guys is doing it exactly, but having as little as possible be sent over the network where a lot of things are either predetermined or they're um, deterministic so that we can launch the thing off and it's going to do the same thing all the time. Now, for Fall Guys, um, I'm not sure how they're doing it or what they're doing, but you got to use a variety of tricks. And, um, also there's interest management stuff so that you're only sending out thing updates at speeds that are close. Like one of the things I know it's built into mirror, but I haven't dug into it too much is the idea of interest management where you can essentially have like a player running around in the world. So say I've got a player right here where my bomb is and he is getting updates of all the NPCs that are maybe in, in the crosswalk area every frame right maybe it's getting ever or every server frame maybe it's like 20 times a second or 10 times a second or whatever we're running at and then as it gets further out we can slow that down so maybe if they're way down here by the end of the road they're getting messages you know maybe at half that rate or a quarter of that rate and as they get closer the the rate of those goes up so we can send less messages over the network um and still and deal with a lot more objects out there and there are obviously lots of other tricks and things, but that's just one of the things that's already kind of built in the interest management stuff. And I'm not sure exactly how mirrors work. So that might be another good, um, another good video topic to go into too, just diving into how interest management works and how you can do that. So I don't know, maybe I'll, I, I'm trying to think through like exactly what I want to do there, but lots, lots of good ideas here. Also, if you guys don't mind just hitting like and subscribe and share real quick one more time by asking questions, really appreciate it. I take a couple more and then I think I'll, wrap it up for today and then we'll do another one pretty soon um based on i guess we'll see what other questions people have too whether ideas come in so if, if other cool stuff comes in maybe we'll do that too let's see um i'm programming a network game through photon what are the pros and cons of photon versus networking price wise um well photon is using i mean photon is a network 
engine. It's just a network engine. And if you're using Photon Cloud, it's a network engine plus hosting service where you're paying for the benefit or the ease of use there. So that they spawn up the servers and they manage them. You don't have to deal with it. And um, it, it costs, right? The, the cost adds up. Now, I don't know the exact cost. But you'd have to figure it out for your game, like based on the bandwidth limitations, the connections and stuff. But in general, I would expect to pay a bit more with a hosted service where it's all managed like that. But hey, maybe you find a crazy deal or they give you some hookup. I'm not really sure. Um, let's see. Hello, how would you handle random values over the network? Send it to all clients or have some sort of pre-visible randomness generator? Great question. Um, you could do two things. You could either have a controlled random seed where you're controlling it and um, determining what every random number is. If you set up the random seed, you're going to get the same number every time for the next one. Um, you just have to make sure that you're calling it the same number of times on everything and get to get the same number, um, and which isn't too hard to do, really. You could set up multiple random number generators even if you wanted to, or you could send the number over the network depending on how you want to do it. So it depends on how often you need to do it. If it's something that's not happening often, you could probably just send it once. If it's something that happened all, all the time, then you probably want to be sending over the seed and then making sure that the usages or the things that are calling to get the, the number from that random generator are synchronized. And if that's the case, then you won't need to send over that number as well. But it may be overkill there and you might just want to send the number instead. Let's see, anything else here? Oh, Mirror uses a proximity checker component is what they're saying. Okay, cool. That, that makes sense. That is a good name for it too. Well, well, I think we're kind of running out of questions. So I think I want to wrap it up here, go take a drink and um, start prepping for the next thing. I got another video um, that will probably come out tomorrow that's going to be on... Um, to interview game developer who's releasing a game. I actually have two of these that are in editing right now. So whichever one comes out first will come out hopefully tomorrow with uh, two different game developers who both built Unity games. One of them is a networked game that's really freaking awesome. And another one is a non-networked game that's going out to Steam that's also really cool. Um, and really fun discussions with them about the process of building the games. Um, one of them is building the game full-time as a job, uh, like the main thing that they're doing. Another one's doing it just completely side side job, like just in spare time, building out a game and releasing it um, over a really quick amount of time too. So it's pretty impressive, um, some really interesting discussion. So if you guys are interested in that stuff, make sure you're subscribed or hit the alert or whatever, or just check back tomorrow, whatever you want to do. Um, it, that should be a, a lot of fun. And if you have um, just requests or I guess ideas, other stuff that you want to see on the channel, or for streams or whatever, just drop a comment below, um, send me an email or whatever. I try to read and reply to all of them as quick as I can. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's about it. Just make sure you hit like, subscribe, share, all that stuff. I had a lot of fun building this out and I'd like to build some more stuff really soon. Got quite a few different ideas. Um, yeah, so having a blast. Thanks again, everybody. I just really appreciate everyone coming out here. It's kind of crazy. It still blows me away that hundreds of people come out and just watch and we go through building games and have fun together so it, it's fun stuff all right um i guess i'll take a drink and wrap it up here say thanks one more time and again don't forget to like subscribe share and all that stuff oh one last thing i was gonna um i got an email i haven't replied to it yet i'm gonna reply after this about um the, the mug here it will be um available sometimes it's just this i thought it was hilarious this little debug mug it cracked me up and um my new favorite cup so if, if you're interested in that, I'll, I'll put a link down in the description too. You can check it out. Um, it's <laughs> sorry, I feel weird, but I, I like the thing. It cracks me up. All right. Um, thanks again, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. Have a great day again. 